afternoon, buenas tardes, and welcome to our September 21st board meeting. Welcome to our board members, MCPS staff, and members of our community who are joining us here today and also watching via live stream. Now let us begin the meeting by standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I will now call the roll to establish that we have a quorum, starting with Mr. Said. Hello, everyone. Sammy Said, student board member. Totally stoked to be here. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Lynn Harris, at-large member. I use she, her pronouns. And I'm wearing my purple in honor of October Domestic Violence Awareness Month a little early because our proclamation is today. Good afternoon. Rebecca Smondrowski, District 2. Good afternoon. Yes. Go ahead, Shepard. Sure. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Shepard Evans, representing District 5. Good afternoon. Brenda Wolf, District 5. And I'm so glad to see so many students joining us today. Good afternoon. Buenas tardes. Good day, Rivera Oven, District 1. And an early happy birthday to our student board member, Mr. Saeed. Good afternoon, Julie Yang, District 3. So good to see everyone here today. Okay. Now we can begin the meeting with the approval of the revised agenda. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that's unanimous. Okay. Uh, now we are going to move on to our recognitions. Um, Dr. McKnight. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we do have recognitions, and I will start with our first, which is recognition of National Disability Employment Awareness Month. October is National Disability Employment Awareness Month in the United States. The official theme for the observance is advancing access and equity, celebrates the, the contributions of individuals with disabilities in the workplace, and honors the 50th anniversary of the passage of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. MCPS, as part of National Disability Awareness Month, recognizes the importance of supportive, inclusive policies and practices that benefit all employees. MCPS fosters the core values that prepare all students to thrive in the future through active engagement in learning, establishing meaningful relationships, modeling respect for all, striving for excellence and equity to eliminate institutional barriers to student success and ensure that equitable practices and policies are used in schools and workplaces. MCPS is committed to promoting a positive, caring, and supportive district in school climate that promotes the benefits of a diverse workforce that includes individuals with disabilities. Therefore, be it resolved that the Montgomery County Board of Education and Superintendent of Schools declare the month of October 2023 as National Disability Employment Awareness Month in Montgomery County Public Schools and encourage staff members in schools to sponsor and participate in activities in honor of its recognition. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that's unanimous. Thank you. Our second recognition is recognition of National Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Montgomery County Public Schools is committed to preventing domestic violence by educating students, staff, and the community and joining advocacy organizations to raise awareness. The National Coalition Against Domestic Violence and the United States Congress have officially recognized October as National Domestic Violence Awareness Month to educate and inform the public about domestic violence, encourage all to speak up about domestic violence, raise awareness about domestic violence, support survivors of domestic violence, and advocate for resources, prevention programs, and education programs. One in every three women and one in every four men have experienced significant physical violence by an intimate partner. One in every 15 children are exposed to domestic violence each year, with approximately 90% having witnessed this violence firsthand. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Montgomery County Board of Education and the Superintendent of Schools declare the month of October 2023 as National Domestic Violence Awareness Month in Montgomery County Public Schools and recommend observance to all of our school communities. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands, and that's unanimous. Thank you. And our third and final uh, recognition is Walk to School Day. 
Walking to school is a great way for children to make a positive difference in their communities, promote healthy habits, improve air quality, pedestrian safety, and environmental awareness. Walking to school reduces traffic congestion and the intake of air pollutants that can be especially harmful to children. Walking to school provides an opportunity to practice mindfulness and bring attention to the need for physical activity as part of a healthy lifestyle. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Education and the Superintendent of Schools proclaim October 4th, 2023 as Walk to School Day and may be it further resolved that the school system notify the public and school community of Walk to School Day and publicize this resolution and the school system's participation through internal and external communications and encourage everyone to consider the safety of pedestrians and in particular, student walkers every day. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that's unanimous. Thank you, that completes recognitions. Okay. Our next agenda item is public comments. Public comments is one of our opportunities to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. Board members will take your comments into consideration, but it is not our practice to take action at this time on issues that are raised. We encourage public input on policy, program, and, proceed and practices. This is not the proper avenue to address specific student or employee matters, so we encourage everyone to utilize existing avenues of redress for complaints. This is a public meeting, and we expect the conduct of all speakers and members of the audience to be within the bounds of proper etiquette. Inappropriate personal remarks, rude retorts, and other such behavior is out of order and will not be tolerated. Those who demonstrate disruptive or disrespectful behavior during public comments may be asked to leave the room. Please check our website for information about upcoming board meetings, hearings, and work sessions, including any changes to our meeting start times. We have 14 people signed up to provide in-person testimony. Each speaker will receive two minutes for comments. When your name is called, please approach the table, speak clearly and directly into the microphone. 30 seconds prior to the expiration of a speaker's time, a yellow light will go on accompanied by a beep. A red light and a buzzer signals that your time has expired. Please push the flat button below the microphone to turn it on and begin speaking. Push the same button once more at the sound of the buzzer to turn it off. In addition to our in-person speakers today, we have one person signed up to provide audio testimony and four people signed up to provide video testimony. We will play these submissions once the in-person testimonies have concluded. Copies of testimonies can be found on BoardDocs, where they are posted with other materials for this meeting. So I will call our first three speakers to the table, please. Ashi Stanislaus, Madeline Aig, and Natalie Jack. Ashley, you may begin. Good afternoon, members of the board and Dr. McKnight. My name is Ashi Stanislaus, and I am the Wooten High School SGA Secretary. I am here again to advocate for the needs of Wooten students. However, today, I am not here to ask for renovation. I am here to ask for basic student needs. In the months since my past testimony, Wooten students have been reporting numerous issues within our school. In particular, students face path problems with the bathrooms every single day. There are many issues including mold, broken toilets, broken faucets, and bathrooms without mirrors. Last year when I needed to use the bathroom during my class, I would have to wait in a long line because there was only one toilet and the other was broken. After months, the toilet was never fixed, and when Board of Education members and MCPS staff came to Tor Wooten, I pointed out this exact bathroom and expressed the problems this caused. To my surprise, this year, on the first day of school, I walked into the same bathroom and the toilet was still not fixed. Moreover, I have friends at Wooten who wear hijabs, and with multiple bathrooms without mirrors, they have no way to ensure they have protected themselves adequately and end up having to walk all around school to find a bathroom that has a mirror. I've had conversations with multiple students who say they don't use the bathrooms at school for the whole day and would rather wait seven hours to go home than use our bathrooms. Our school bathrooms need to be in a clean and healthy usable condition that people feel safe to use. 
Wooten SGA created a building services forum last year where students could fill out problems they see at school and relay it back to building services. Although this has been helpful, I believe we need something even more effective. I think that MCPS should develop an app that students can use to log building problems they see at school. A lot of times, staff might not experience what students do at school, so this way students can report things firsthand. Staff, admin, and building services can have access to the app, so as soon as an issue has been identified, the school can handle it efficiently. It can also be a good way for MCPS to see the reoccurring issues that, this county, that the schools in this county face, and best how to fix it. I hope you take my recommendations into consideration, and thank you for your time. Thank you. Madeline? Good afternoon, Dr. McKnight and members of the board. My name is Madeline Eig, and I am a junior member of Wooten High School Student Government Association and the current SJ historian. Today, I would like to bring your attention to the hazardous building where 1,840 students come to learn every day. Above being a leader, I'm a student who believes that everyone has the right to be kept out of danger when they enter or exit school. We should feel comfortable in our learning environment, but the standards that Wooten is held at are not ADA compliant. During our most recent fire drill last Thursday, I noticed that it took nine minutes for the school to successfully evacuate every student from the building. In a real emergency, nine minutes is an unacceptable amount of time. I watched a boy in front of me fall on an uneven path due to the swarm of students pushing into him. I also observed a student on crutches trip because our sidewalks are full of cracks and uneven surfaces. Had this been a real emergency, both of these students would have gotten majorly injured. It doesn't make me feel confident about my safety at Wooten. We appreciate that MCPS has begun the process of planning corrections to certain ADA issues. However, I ask that you provide immediate resources to alleviate issues like the cracks in the sidewalks. I hope that by gaining the funding to create safe exits that are paved and include ramps, all students will know that the county truly cares about them. In the meantime, I ask that you continue the ADA correction process in a timely manner. Our previous community meetings in this process were postponed. While I understand that you have not pushed back the ADA compliance completion date, I worry that 2026 is too far away for Wooten students. Thus, I hope we can move this date sooner, or at least provide funding for the basic necessities for students. Thank you for your time. I hope to work together in the future to create solutions that work for the students, staff, and school system. Thank you. Natalie? Good evening, members of the board and Dr. McKnight. My name is Natalie Jack, and I'm a junior at Wooten High School. Today, I'm here to highlight the dysfunctional and unhygienic environment that negatively impacts students' learning at Wooten. In 2016, I attended a drama camp held at Wooten. Although this camp was fun and engaging, I, a 10-year-old little girl, felt disgusted using the Wooten bathroom. I remember waiting in line for a bathroom with only one stall open. I remember the revolting odor coming from the toilets, forcing me to cover my nose as I used the bathroom. And I remember the embarrassing moment when I had to ask my counselors to hold the door shut when it wouldn't close. When I entered high school two years ago, I'd expected no odor, no weight, and an actual lock on all the stalls. Yet six years later, it was the exact same. I wondered, why is that? Why is it that six years later, I attend a school I'm supposed to be proud of when I can't even use the bathroom? When I was gathering data for this testimony, I asked my friends for their opinions on our school's bathrooms. All of them replied with similar answers relating to the putrid toilets, unusable sinks, large stall gaps, and decaying floors. All of them, uh, after encountering the bathrooms for the first time freshman year, I swore to never use them and say wait until I got home. Holding a full, ba full bladder all day long is not only uncomfortable, but puts you at numerous health risks. The fact that students have to risk their health and comfortability due to our debilitated bathrooms is wrong. The students here today have taken Wooten's first steps towards bringing a better environment for our school. We'd like to take the next ones with you. In order for Wooten's bathrooms to improve, we need your full support and accountability throughout the whole process. It can start as simple as providing, building, providing our building services with more resources to get rid of any mold or disdaining orders in the hopes of finally keeping our bathrooms clean. Members of the board and Dr. McKnight, I urge you to invest your time and attention in alleviating these issues. Thank you. Thank you. If we could have our next three speakers, please come forward. Maddie Matthew, Ria Chaler, and Sakia Sankara Jabbar. Maddie, you may begin. 
Good afternoon, members of the board and Dr. McKnight. My name is Maddie Matthew. I'm a junior at Thomas Wooten High School and a leader within our school's SGA. Today, I'm here before you to speak about Wooten's faulty air conditioning system. With over 1,800 hardworking students, many would think that Wooten would be provided with a sufficient and up-to-date school infrastructure. Sadly, this isn't the case. Our educations are greatly impacted by the internal problems that come along with attending Wooten. The worst of these problems is our dysfunctional air conditioning system. I never know what I'm going to expect when I start each day at Wooten. In fact, I remember the first day of school. I was sitting down on my first period class, so excited to start my junior year, but I couldn't focus whatsoever. Rather, I was shivering from my frigid classroom. I thought this dysfunctionality was only limited to my first period. However, the next class I went to across the building was so hot that I started to sweat. As I went about my first day, I saw the repeated pattern of one class being extremely hot while the next was extremely cold. I thought that maybe the problem would re be resolved. But as the weeks passed, I and many other students at Wooten still face these problems today. The extreme differences in tensions in temperature throughout the building causes many students to have a hard time focusing in class. In fact, every student have to layer, not for the outdoors, but for their own classrooms. It's frustrating and disappointing that students at Wooten have problems like this affecting their educational performance. Wooten students shouldn't have to be distracted from their studies, preventing them from attaining a sufficient education. Why can't a student just focus on being a student? In order to fix this problem, a new, air a new air conditioning needs to be installed immediately. However, I understand that budgetary issues exist. I ask that in the meantime, you provide our building services team with support and do not forget the issues we experience at Wooten. I urge you, I urge you, you, I urge you Dr. McKnight and Board of Education members to consider what I've addressed and take timely action. Thank you for taking the time to listen. Thank you. Maddie? I'm sorry, Rhea. <laughs> Good afternoon, members of the board and Dr. McKnight. My name is Rhea Chalar. I'm a senior at Wooten High School, and I have the honor of serving as the co-president of the Wooten Student Government Association this year. As I'm sure you all remember, it's safe to say that Wooten had a large presence in the Board of Education testimonies last year. We were pleased to see plans to visit our building form promptly after voicing our opinions on the crumbling infrastructure. Many of you were led around our building by our SGA and ambassadors as we pointed out our specific concerns. However, walking through the hallways today, I see many of these urgent issues continue to persist, which is extremely disappointing to our school community. I am now here asking you to include more student involvement in this process and increase accountability and transparency around the discussion around Wooten's infrastructure. As I mentioned previously, after the visit by the director of the Department of Facilities Management, little to no changes occurred. While our student group consisting of students who have had first-hand experience with mold damage at Wooten expressed our concerns about water leakage in the ceilings leading to mold formation, our thoughts were dismissed quickly, making it seem like our efforts to prevent future damage to our school building were not being taken as serious issues. While our testimony last year was focused on already existing concerns, our main goal was to continue practices that will provide a safe and livable school building for generations in the future. Unfortunately, it's still apparent that our ideas have not been supported in the way that they need to be. We appreciate the board's ongoing commitment to support the students, particularly in your recognition of our concerns. However, we ask for more accountability and resources for building services in this process. Moreover, there is an abundance of student voices at Wooten who are happy to provide insight and guidance to MCPS. And with our inside perspective and views, we hope that MCPS will expand their work with Wooten students to understand how we are directly affected by these issues. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Sukiya? Can you hear me? Yes. Good. I'm Zakia Sankara Jabbar. I am an MCPS parent of a black male student, and I am also the co director, co executive director for Racial Justice Now. Uh, Racial Justice Now is a community organization uh, that centers the needs of black parents, black families, and black students, and we work specifically to end the school to prison pipeline. Uh, I am here specifically to talk about uh, what I see as systemic uh, anti-blackness uh, that is deepened within some of our MCPS schools and certainly within the system itself. MCF, MCPS likes to prize, prize itself on uh, being equity driven and, you know, type statements and reports. However, uh, the OLO report from the Office of Legislative Oversight uh, from Dr. Elaine Bonner-Tompkins, which we had the opportunity to work with her over the last year, look 
looked at student discipline data, uh, and I, you know, can't believe that the student discipline data has not only uh, increased for black students, right, uh, it hasn't improved at all uh, when it comes to disproportionality of school discipline for the same infractions that other uh, demographic students um, uh, do as well, but black students, particularly black male students, receive the harshest punishment. Um, and I was also um, horrified uh, to see the response to the fight uh, that we all saw on social media uh, between BCC and WJ students. Uh, my organization is well aware of the uh, systemic anti-blackness that, ex that exists in that particular quadrant of this school district, and we do not believe that enough has been done on the part of this school board and this superintendent to protect black students from the toxic environment of anti-blackness in that particular school system. We have mountains of evidence of black students taking to Instagram, creating documentaries over the last several years, detailing the experiences that they have as black students uh, in those schools. And so I just want to end by saying I hope that MCPS, the school board, and the superintendent take seriously the students' needs and black students in this district and to make sure that you're taking the steps necessary to end the school. Thank you. If we could have our next speakers please come forward. Hamza Ewing, Meseret Chaka, and Laura Berthun. Hamsa Ewing, oh, yeah. Meseret Chaka, and Laura Berthun. And Hamza, you may begin. Good afternoon, Dr. McKnight and members of the MCPS Board of Education. My name is Hamza Ewing. I'm the Maryland Outreach Coordinator for the Council on American Islamic Relations, our nation's largest Muslim civil rights and advocacy organization. I'm also a graduate of MCPS and a current Montgomery County resident. I'm here to strongly urge you to respect the diversity within your school system by restoring students' rights to opt out of discussing and affirming readings that would not only force students to compromise their sincerely held religious beliefs, but would also put vulnerable students at risk of being triggered or subjected to mental and emotional harm. We've heard much about the concerns of religious families during this debate, but they're not the only families impacted by MCPS's stance. Karen, in fact, recently heard from an MCPS parent who has an autistic child within your school system. This makes it very complicated and traumatic for them to learn conflicting values and information, especially when it comes to sensitive concepts related to gender and romantic relations relationships. It would also be very difficult and disruptive for them to be forced to affirm concepts and values about those topics that are different from the concepts and values taught at home. Doesn't this child deserve to have the unique vulnerabilities respected and valued? Does MCPS not believe that children in these and other circumstances should have the right to opt out of discussing supplemental content that risks unnecessarily inflicting mental and emotional stress upon them? Keep in mind, this debate is not about teaching evolution within science class. This is about the teaching of gender, family life, and romantic relationships. In English class, there's absolutely no need to force students to discuss and affirm these sensitive topics in English class as early as pre-K, yet that is exactly what MCPS is doing. According to the documents CARE obtained through our open records request, MCPS had advised teachers to single out not only those students with traditional religious views, but to also disrupt their thinking, scold them, or outright silence them. This is wrong. This issue should not have to be litigated in courts. You shouldn't need a judge to issue a ruling advising you to protect vulnerable students and take into consideration developmental delays, disabilities, and religion when considering what children will be forcibly exposed to in your schools. We urge you to restore opt-out for the sake of your students who are being deeply affected by the current school climate. MCPS must also make it clear to principals that English teachers should be given advance notice about these books and discussions to parents who ask for notice. This allows parents the opportunity to talk to the children in advance or facilitate alternate arrangements. Thank you. We have your testimony. For the sake of especially your most vulnerable students, <laughs> Thank this you. is what least MC MCPS should do right now. Thank you. Laura? Go ahead and press your microphone, the button underneath the microphone. Yep. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, members of the board, superintendent, and staff, um, I'm Laura Berthium, and I used to sit in that seat right over there uh, a few years ago. I'm returning today on a mission of educational mercy, in my view. Um, you have my written testimony, and I 
uh, added the materials to your mailboxes earlier today, so I'm not going to read it all to you. I'm going to hit some bullet points. Point one, Montgomery County is liable for the actions of its employees if those actions harm children in their care. Actions that are undertaken by government without a rational basis are unconstitutional. The action of this system reported in the news a few weeks ago requiring some children to wear N95 masks for up to six hours a day for five days straight lacked any rational scientific basis. The January 30th, 2023 Cochrane Review, which is a rigorous meta-analysis of all of the relevant scientific studies, concluded that wearing masks in the community probably makes little to no difference to the outcome of COVID-19 compared to not wearing masks, and there was no clear difference between the use of surgical masks and N95s. Placing an N95 mask on a seven-year-old for hours on end, days on end, is inhumane and is reasonably likely to cause physical damage to children's brains and reproductive systems. The February 21, 2023 study in the Hellion Journey Journal, Scientific Journal, found compelling scientific evidence chronic masking causes irreversible neuron damage, brainstem neuron apoptosis, that means death, increased anxiety, impaired learning and memory, and potentially impaired reproductive abilities. Forcing a child to wear an N95 mask could be criminally charged under the Maryland Criminal Code for injury to a child as a result of inhumane treatment. Five years ago, before COVID, it would have been charged had a group of adults conspired to put a child in a mask restricting their breathing for days on end. To any person in this room or in the sound of my voice, please snap out of the mass formation psychosis by almighty God. I call you to come out from under that spell. Thank you. Thank you. If we could get our next speakers to please come forward. Doug Hill, Adrian Hinderley, and Fasika Damtu. And Doug Hill, you may begin. Yes. First, apologies for the sunglasses. We're covering from an eye condition that makes me light sensitive. Through research, they've identified five inclusive mindsets that shape behaviors. Self-awareness, curiosity, courage, vulnerability, and empathy. These mindsets are critical for organizations' ability to create an environment where all individuals feel respected, valued, and able to contribute their best work. When people thrive, organizations can thrive. In an inclusive environment, people feel valued, respected, and supported. This allows them to feel a stronger sense of connection and the positive emotion of belonging. One result is a deeper sense of engagement so people feel passionate about their school and are committed to delivering their best work. For inclusion to be sustainable, it must become embedded into an organization's systems, processes, and policies. As a parent of two MCPS alumni and also a graduate of public school education, I can tell you that there is no end to the work that you have to do, as you heard about a re a testimony earlier about the work that needs to be done to even out the equity in administering punishment to students. So in the process of trying to come to a decision about your opt-out decisions, uh, ideas uh, our exposure to ideas is not indoctrination. Strong home values can overcome any exposure to an idea that might be unacceptable for religious, political, or other purposes. Thank you. Thank you. Adrian, you may begin. Good afternoon, Dr. McKnight, members of the board. My name is Adrian Hinderley. I use both they, them, and he, him pronouns. I'm a proud co-chair of the Coalition for Inclusive Schools and Communities, and I have the privilege of growing up here, have had the privilege of growing up here in Montgomery County. I am here, albeit a little nervous, in my N95 mask as a black and transgender individual in hopes of sharing my unique and intersectional lens to this board and other community members. In our digital world, I often find myself stuck to my electronic devices. Sometimes it can seem that I'm losing touch with the avid reader that I was when I was younger. 
I can recall hours spent reading books, from picture books like And Tango Makes Three by Peter Parnell and Justin Richardson, to chapter books like Parrot Fish by Ellen Whitlinger. I continue to find the drive to discover new books that reflect my own experience in someone else's writing. As I've grown older, it's been affirming for me to read books about characters with complex identities, some similar to my own lived experience. Books like Freshwater by Akweke Amezi and Felix Ever After by Case and Calendar. As I pursue a master's in social work and work closely with LGBTQIA youth and young adults in this county, I can only imagine how much more impactful it would have been to have access to more books like these, books that reflect my own intersectional experiences during childhood. As students grow into the next generation of leaders, it is essential they learn to exercise kindness and compassion towards themselves and others, practices that can be facilitated by inclusive books in schools and communities. Some books may cause unease or uncertainty when they don't reflect one's own experience. But the benefits of stepping into discomfort by learning how other people exist is essential to building safe and accepting schools and safe and accepting communities. Thank you. Thank you. Kasika, you may begin. Hey, good afternoon. My name is Fasika Damtu, and this is my second time testifying in front of you asking for the opt-out policy. I have a child where the school wants to read this book. It's called Pride Puppy. As you can see, the book is colorful, and what kid doesn't get attracted to a rainbow and a puppy, huh? However, inside the book, these are the words you see and expecting four and five-year-olds to understand them. Let me read their definitions. I is for intersex, individual born with any of several sex characteristics. Q for queer, sexual identity not corresponding to established uh, sexual ideas. P for pride, even celebrating people with different sexual orientation. See any pattern here? Let me continue. Drag queen, drag kings, leather, like lip rings. The list goes on. Now, why would you want to force four and five-year-olds to hear these age-inappropriate words? What good comes from that except confusing them? If you have a special kid who is not affected by these types of books, get the book from the library and read it to them. Or let the child join the human growth and sexuality class because that's where this, belo this book belongs to. Now, a note to the LGBTQ community. Understand that we are not criticizing you. We, the concerned parents, are criti criticizing contents that are sexual in nature, portrayed as educational. It does not matter if the characters in the books are heterosexuals or not. Any content that is sexual should not be allowed in classrooms. To the board, stop sexualizing and grooming our children. Let our kids learn education, literacy, please. Thank you. We could have our next three speakers please come forward. Kiribal Fresenbet, Robert Stubblefield, and Rosalind Hansen. Hello, good afternoon. Thanks for giving me the chance to speak again. I'd like to give you some advice. In a word, assumptions blind hypothesis guide. I see this board assume that I'm a Muslim, which I'm not. I'm a Christian. Ms. Wolf gave me her apologies, which I deeply respect. You keep assuming that we are against exposure of ideas to our kids. We're not. There is a difference between exposure and indoctrination. Look at the books. We are not just against you. We are just asking for our rights. Stop assuming that you have the power to put ideas in my kid, to shape their belief, because you don't. 
I see a new policy that you're putting forward, which puts you, Dr. McKnight, as an equal partner on my kids with me. <laughs> I'm sorry, you're not their mother. They have a mother and they have a father. Okay, you cannot be partner with me. Your job is to serve the public, not to be a partner. Our tax dollars are paid to you to serve. Please get that into your minds. You are here to serve the community, not to be a partner, not to dictate how we live, or not even to dictate how our kids will be brought up, how they will grow up. It's my job. It's my right. It's my God-given right. After you leave this office, you wouldn't care about my kid. My kid will stay with me for the rest of her life. For I will, her problems will be my problems for the rest of my life, as long as I live, not as long as you live. You don't even know her. You never met her. How can you become partner with me or my children? This is absurd. Please wake up, all of you. What you're doing is wrong. It's based on assumptions. Stop that assumption. Thank you. Thank you. Board members and Superintendent McKnight, uh, you each received an email invitation earlier this week uh, for, from our founders for this next Tuesday's town hall hosted by Moms for Liberty in Silver Spring. In addition, I just gave each of you a personal invitation with a literal olive branch on it. I hope that you'll take it and join us. We want you there and we want to engage. This is my second time testifying in the last several months. In May, I waited patiently to hear from someone to be responded to because Superintendent McKnight, you said that everyone who testifies hears from someone. I'm still waiting. In June, we found out that our Hispanic community is completely missing from our campus um, arrest data. That was supposed to be to us a week later. We're still waiting. I'm a parent who is at every PTA meeting. I'm on every PTA chair. I go all day to the field trips. I make the biscuits. I am there. I am engaged. I know everything that happens in every single minute on every single campus. I am the engaged parent. And if I don't get an answer, at first I thought, it, well, it's because she's Moms for Liberty and because headlines say that she's a hateful person. And then I was like, well, maybe it's because I'm Catholic or maybe it's because I'm not gay. And I'm like, no, they're not discriminatory people. They just don't care about parents. They just don't care because I'm still waiting for an answer. I'm still waiting to be acknowledged. I'm still waiting to be heard. And my thing in May wasn't even about the opt out. You just don't care about parents. I hope I'm wrong. I hope you'll come on Tuesday. I hope you'll engage and lean in and take the olive branch because it was once a really great school district, but we've had a lot of mess ups, a lot of mess ups lately. And the only person who can fix that with God. So I'm gonna pray. I guess I'm not, cause my two minutes is up. Thank you. We received uh, one audio testimony from Albert Gal. If we could please play the audio. Good morning, Board of Education. My name is Albert Gal, and I am with EcoMoco. As a high school student, I enjoy keeping up with sports and I can confirm it's something that unites every school. Throughout the past decade or so, MCPS has pushed to implement artificial turf fields at some schools for a fair reason. However, artificial turf presents environmental issues. Firstly, the blades of grass uh, degrade through contact with the sun and wear and tear in sports. Annually, a field loses 200 to 3,200 pounds of the plastic waste, which ends up in the environment, negatively affecting all organisms. There needs to be a more organic substitute to the plastic grass. Secondly, although MCPS has plans to replace turf infill with more organic materials, the current infill needs to be changed as soon as possible. Crumb rubber is the main material used, and the National Toxicology Program reports they have found PAHs, metals, plasticizers, and bisphenol A in the material, all of which uh, can be dangerous chemicals. 
For this reason, turf infill should be changed as soon as possible instead of waiting for potentially a decade uh, to replace. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We received four video testimonies. The first video is from Jennifer Martin. If you could please play the video. Good evening, board members and Superintendent Dr. McKnight. The members of the Montgomery County Education Association are grateful to have had the chance to participate in the school climate survey this past spring, the first such survey since 2019. The results vary greatly school by school, and as such support the anecdotal information our staff and union leaders have heard from our members. Unfortunately, there are places in MCPS where staff are mistreated, disrespected, and afraid. We urge you to delve into the worksite data to determine where greater attention to climate is needed. We must focus on creating safety for MCPS employees and a culture where frontline staff are respected and taken seriously when they speak up about the challenges they are facing. Survey results are only a beginning point for the work that must be done to create positive working and learning environments at all our schools. The members of MCEA care deeply about our students and families. We devote our professional lives meeting the highest standards for teaching and learning. We have long partnered with the system in setting and upholding these standards for our bargaining unit members through the peer assistance and review program and the teacher professional growth system. We in turn deserve that same care and professionalism from management at every MCPS worksite. There are approximately 150 principals who've been leading a school in MCPS for five years or less, and staff turnover in recent years has also changed much of the teacher level leadership. So it is high time to once again invest the time and resources in training schools instructional leadership teams how to practice shared decision making. Principals and staff in many schools need support in establishing mutual trust and respect so that together we can pursue our common goal of attracting and retaining the best educators to provide all our students with the excellent learning opportunities they deserve. Thank you. Our next video is from Arhat Saxena. Please play the video. Good afternoon. My name is Arhat Saxena and I am currently a 10th grader at John F. Kennedy High School. I am here to support efforts in creating an inclusive and representative curriculum for LGBTQ individuals. As a student of MCBS, I and many other students have witnessed the lack of representation of queer individuals in the curriculum. The erasure of LGBTQ individuals throughout history has further exacerbated the ignorance that students face when talking about the LGBTQ community. This failure to address these issues has created a scenario in which queer students don't feel seen or heard in schools, and they aren't adequately included in conversations regarding history, literature, and topics of diversity. Furthermore, being exposed to queer literature and history can have massive impacts on the well-being of queer youth. Every single student in school deserves the right to feel safe, secure, and included in classrooms. So by having a curriculum that is completely devoid of the historic impact that queer individuals have had in our country, those classrooms are no longer an inclusive space for those students. This goes beyond the issues of the queer community. If all people, including people of color, women, and those with disabilities aren't represented, MCBS cannot claim that classrooms are inclusive of every single student. In the past, MCBS has stated that it takes pride in the level of support for both students and staff that identify as part of the LGBTQ community. I'm aware of how much pressure the board has been under by parents to restore opt-outs of LGBTQ books and remove queer history. However, if MCBS does not take a firm stance against this effort, then it has failed to uphold their previous statement. While the board is certainly capable of tiptoeing around the issue and trying to please both sides, I would like to remind you that until you place LGBTQ plus individuals at the forefront of the curriculum, you cannot claim to support queer individuals. After all, how can you support those that you won't fully include and acknowledge in school? While I've included more information in my written testimony, I urge all of you on the board today to listen to students like me and stand up for the LGBTQ plus community in their fight for equality and inclusivity. Thank you. Thank you. Our next uh, video testimony is from Evelyn Chung. Please play the video. Hello, my name is Evelyn Chung and I represent the MCCPTA Curriculum Committee. For the first time last year, MCPS began offering limited seats in the state mandated Health B course at most but not all high schools. For the class of 2025, this was their first opportunity to take the course. For the, during the summer of 2023, last summer, MCPS did not offer a central summer school health B option. 
only about half of the 26 high schools offered in-person local summer school healthy courses. Students whose schools did not offer the course had no way of finding out whether or how they could take it at a neighboring school. And the extremely limited school seats filled up quickly with much higher demand than availability. The class of 2025 is running out of time to fulfill the state graduate requirement. Although MCPS assured us that they would offer an after-school online health B course option, the seats for the fall and winter sessions are already filled. MCPS did not tell students about the option, either through central announcements or through high school's counselors. And in fact, some students who asked their counselors for options outside of the school day were explicitly told that there were none. However, within a week after our committee found and posted the link for the course on Facebook, all of the Health B Fall and Winter online courses were completely full. MCPS has not provided enough seats to meet the strong demand. We again <clears throat> ask this board to require MCPS to one, add and broadly advertise additional after school online health B courses, two, report to the board how it is ensuring that schools are prioritizing the class of 2025, three, report the number of class of 2025 students who still have not taken the course, and four, report how they are ensuring that the summer school has enough seats to meet demand and how and when they will advertise the summer option and registration information. We have heard from many parents and students that this situation is very stressful and is putting some students at risk of not graduating on time. Our students deserve better. For more information on this issue and for our testimony on elementary ELA, please see my written testimony. Thank you. Our final video testimony comes from Ali Bell. Please play the video. Hello, I'm Reverend Ali Casey Bell. I'm a black trans man who is one of the ministers at Cedar Lane Unitarian Universalist Congregation. I am the co one of the co-chairs of the Coalition for Inclusive Schools and Communities and also am on the Montgomery County Anti-Hate Task Force. Most importantly, I'm a parent of a 10th grader in Montgomery County Public Schools. I'm talking to you today about the books that have inclusive text in them. And I'm coming to talk to you about them today because last year in Montgomery County Public Schools, there were 237 reports of hate-based incidents. And this is not good. Um, there's a person called Francis David, and he said, we need not think alike to love alike. And that's what I want you to think about today. I know as a parent, it is difficult to hear from your school system that there is not a way to opt out of something that you may not believe. As a black parent, I get it. But I also know that there are things that I don't know, uh, peoples that I don't understand, and relationships that I may not be in the know about that I want my son to understand, to know, and experience, because that's diversity. At home, we learn everything that we need to learn about our values and our beliefs, because that's my job as his parent. At school, they prepare him for the world. That's what I expect of my schools. I expect this year that 237 children can be safe because they've learned about diversity. Thank you. This will conclude our public comments. The next business meeting of the Board of Education for public comments is October 12, 2023. Sign us for public comment will open on Thursday, October 5th at 6 p.m. In addition to the online signups for public comment, we allow for in-person same-day signups when space allows. Unallocated slots may be filled on a first-come, first-served basis on the day of the meeting. In order to sign up in person, please arrive at least 15 to 20 minutes before the start of the open session and sign the form. In-person signups will close 15 minutes before public comment begins or when all slots are filled. Now I will turn to my, co uh, my colleagues to see if they have comments or questions. I will start with Mrs. Madraski. Yeah, thank you. I want to start off by thanking everybody for their testimony, especially our students. Um, we know that there are concerns about Wooten and we're working on it. And I'm um, assuming we'll get an update at some point on where we are with the ADA stuff and everything, and the bathrooms particularly. Um, also, um, and the 
effort of time. Um, can we get a written um, response to Ms. Chung's um, questions specifically for the board um, on the summer program? Thank you. Ms. Harris. Yeah, I just want to echo everything Ms. Madrowski says. And I saw, I saw Mr. Adams there, and if he wants to come down and give an update on the bathroom issue, um, that would be appreciated by this bank of young students here, um, and also the HVAC, and also, yeah, anyway, I'm sure And then while he's doing I would be very interested to see um, if we have data on how many members of the class of 25 still lack health B because um, when they started as freshmen, when many students take health, that was not a requirement. It, so they're, right. they are playing catch up and mm -hmm. they only have one more year. So yeah, thank, thank you. you. Mr. Adams. So, so thank you. Um, thank you for the testimony from our students. Uh, just to give everyone an update, if, if you recall, we've, we've been going through the Wooten High School project as part of the CIP for, for many years now. Um, but one of the things that, uh, obviously, from, from the superintendent's recommendation and ultimately what the board requested was an acceleration of funds as part of that project. Acceleration of funds within that project was sort of a smaller amount intended to do some of the site work, some of the ADA work. Uh, the teams have, have, have gone through, you know, initial reviews, the initial process. Uh, the architect was selected through, through a committee process with the school. Um, but what really, um, I think, jumped out at us as we were going through that process is we're looking at big picture, you know, what will Wooten look like when we get to the uh, major capital project? How do we sort of do, do certain aspects, ADA, other improvements, you know, at the early part? Uh, and what we have what we found is that we really do need to just take a small step back and, and focus on, on some of the interior elements of the building that are most impactful to students. You heard about the restrooms. We've, we've, we've walked the building. We've, we've heard loud and clear about restrooms. We've heard about you know, some of the ADA access inside the building for, for some of our special education programs. We've heard about exterior aspects. So uh, what we intend to do is in, in a couple weeks, um, we've been working with the principal, we've been working with the school administration. Uh, we we want to go back out and, and really have a different approach to this particular project. Um, and that approach is going to be to go out and do some interior renovations. I mean, some, some folks may say, why are you going to spend money on a building if you're going to come back in a couple of years to, to demolish or, or to re-renovate? It just makes sense. It makes sense to do this work now. It makes sense to um, impact or, or to improve those conditions um, in advance. And, and for us, I think it's good money spent. It's, good, it's a good investment to, to, to improve some of those conditions. So we're going to use that money that's been uh, uh, appropriated by the county council as part of, obviously, your request. And we're going to start meeting with the school in a couple weeks to really walk through and, and find those big, big value impact projects uh, that we can do uh, hopefully starting this year and into next summer into the following year. So that's where we are and we will obviously be coming out and walking the building with, with our students. That's, that's something that um, we found very, very helpful uh, last year and we intend to continue with that process moving forward. Just a, a, a quick question. Any sign when the bathroom issues will be Fixed. So, so that's actually, as I said, we, we went back this summer. We started to go through the building and looking for ways to um, renovate and actually rebuild some of the bathrooms. So uh, the architects that have been selected for that project are, are actively working on that, <laughs> designing that. Um, so we want to take those concepts back out in a couple weeks and really vet that to make sure we're, we're headed in the right direction with our students. So I think, I think that work can certainly start this school year. Ms. Rivera Oven. Thank you. I'm not going to repeat myself, but thank you for taking that into account. I just wanted to make sure also that the bathrooms were equipped with feminine products, the the um, the girls' bathrooms. But you know, that's kind of a mute point if you can. I really use the bathrooms also. So uh, just uh, uh, there's nothing worse, and I think we all have uh, horrible bathroom stories. Um, that you know, it's a hygiene issue, and it's a basic thing that you know. And, and as, as a mom, as a woman, I totally sympathize with, uh, with, with our students. So thank you for taking time out of your school day. I hope you're not skipping too many classes to be here, but we appreciate you being here. <laughs> but it's for today's for a good cause, OK? Um, so I just wanted to, um, 
uh, Mr. Geo's, Mr. Aubrey Geo's point on the artificial fields. I don't know if we have anybody who can talk about that. Um, there's been also some, um, and when I was the chair of CUF, we had a lot of discussions about the environmental effects that this had. I don't want to have a school science discussion about it, but I want to do talk about the life expectancy of it. And there's been a lot of stuff on social media about the dangers of the wear and tear of our official fields and how this can actually, and not just at a high school level, but at a college level uh, and other levels, that how this can cause serious injuries for our athletes if they are, um, if they are, overly used, um, and I know there's been some stuff on social media about the cases for high school uh, turf field, so. Dr. You... McKnight? No, I was, Dr. Mr. Adams is here <laughs> at the table, and he can certainly address it. I did just want to say that this is something that we've been working on for a few years now, and there are two things that we have had to reconcile when it comes down to the, the turf and then the actual field growing grass, and one has been just the maintenance um, of them just trying to figure out how that can be sustained over time with the proper resources because we just haven't been structured to be able to do that. Second is the cost. Um, we, it, it is a significant cost um, to actually move to, uh, to having grass fields, but in addition to that, the resources that it will take to upkeep those fields also will be a significant cost. And when I say significant, I mean millions of dollars because um, we've done a couple of estimates of exactly what that would be, even if even when we rolled it out. So I just wanted to say that um, that's been one of the biggest challenges. Every, you know, we've had to talk about this, but most importantly for our community, the conversation is safe, right? And and so there have been questions around safety of using turf, and, and I know there have been a number of studies out there um, you know, that, that say a number of different things. Mr. Adams, do you want to talk about that, some of that information more specifically? Sure. And, and and I will just start with the maintenance. So, so the one aspect around maintenance is we, we do have a robust maintenance with our official turf process, which is very public, it's very transparent. It's, it's posted on our website every, every test. Um, you know, the, the Gaithersburg aspect that you talk about, yes, we, we did a test. Uh, there was an area of concern, which was a heavily used area. Uh, we, we obviously came in, contractors came in, our teams came in, rectified that, we retested, it passes. Um, but, but not to say, those, those fields, Gaithersburg, Wooten, and Paint Branch are eligible for replacement, and we're working through that process, hopefully bringing an RFP to uh, the board here soon. Uh, but to Dr. McKnight's point, you know, I, I think there's, there's always a lot of conversations about our official turf. Um, we actively, through uh, Dr. Sullivan, actively tracks all injuries not only on grass fields, artificial turf fields, so this is something that we are very, very attuned to and, and monitor. Um, but what I would say is that, you know, we do not have evidence in any of our fields where, where this is causing uh, safety hazards above and beyond even our natural grass fields. So when we think about artificial turf, it's really about playability. It's about keeping kids on campus. It's about keeping, you know, being able to use these fields uh, basically year-round in, in, in ways that you cannot do with grass fields. So um, I know there's a lot of conversations on this, uh, obviously through community use public facilities, through the Parks Department, um, but, but we certainly welcome um, any questions about the safety, about the maintenance, but, but I would say please you know, check out our website, check out Dr. Sullivan's website. There's a tremendous amount of information there that, uh, uh, that can be found about both, both aspects. And just the last thing, I know we're going to be responding to Mrs. Um, Ms. Evelyn Chong on the, and, and if we could have a CC on that response, because um, I would love to know some of those answers myself for, for uh, so I can share it in my community as well. Yes. Thank you. Most definitely. Ms. Yang? Yes, thank you, thank you. I also want to thank everyone who come in uh, to testify. And I really like one sentence that Madeline said. Madeline said, she hoped to work together to solve issues, and that just means tremendously, um, you know, uh, to us because um, uh, students, you are our future. So to have you participate, uh, I think that's wonderful for all of us. Now, I do. I associate myself with many comments my colleague made. I also want to um, point out that. Um, Ms. Martin mentioned about the climate survey. And this year, um, in one, uh, among our board priority of two-way communication, we have said 
uh, that we will work towards a structure to capture our staff's feedback and have their uh, partnership and engagement with us because we know that we have a lot of experts in the field among our staff. So um, that's duly noted, and we are working um, to, um, to use these uh, uh, survey data. Ms. Wolf? I, I think that, um, that Ms. Yang covered most of what I wanted to say. It was about the, the climate survey, and I wanted to know how this, this, the staff knows that we use the data, but do they get to see the basic data results themselves? Uh, Dr. Murphy, I'll probably refer to you, but yes, they get to see it. I think um, for years, even though we've restructured some things about the survey, we give it back to the school. I think the biggest conversation that would be great for us to have is how is it utilized? Um, that seems to be you know, a big part of what we want to talk about and what we want to share with our staff and communities when they get that information what are we what are they doing with it and as we look at it you know how do we support the things that may be obvious in that yeah i have seen several comments online where people would like to see the climate survey results and i don't know if there is a way <laughs> to post that without I, I don't want to put any school in the situation of being feeling singled out, but I do think it's important for people to have that kind of information. And I would want you to think about how we might be able to display results, not so much for comparison, but for people to actually see what's going on in their schools and whether or not, if you do a survey again next year, they can see improvement. Yes. Thank you. Don't see any other lights on, um, so we will move on to our next agenda item, and that's agenda item number five. Uh, we are going to be talking about progress monitoring and a very important student data path um, milestone, which is the end of year 2022-2023, so it's last school year, reading grade three data. Um, again, we are, as a part of every uh, board meeting, we are talking about our data, and particularly our pathway data, in terms of getting to college and career readiness so that we have a deeper understanding of where we are um, every, at every point in our, in our board meeting process. So Dr. Minet, I will pass it on to you. Thank you, Ms. Silvestri. Um, and welcome to the table, the staff. Uh, we are looking forward to talking today about the student data um, what's most exciting about the conversation is we're going to talk about the student data through the lens of the pathways. Um, of course, we rolled it out last spring, and we are in the um, we are fully implementing that this year. And today we're going to begin the first of several presentations that we're going to have around student data, but through the lens of the college career and community pathways. The second academic milestone indicator in the pathway is uh, in reading, and we all know the importance of uh, measuring reading by grade three for our students. And we look at grade three in a benchmark perspective in which we look at students in grade three and their reading level by Lexile score. Um, and that Lexile score is attained by a assessment that we've known and used for years um, here in Montgomery County Public Schools and other places that's called the MAP assessment, MAP-R, um, MAP for reading. So although students have been engaging in the uh, MAP assessment, this is the first time that we're using this data point specifically to look at how we are doing in grade three through the lens of the academic milestone of the college career community pathways. So with that, today we're going to be focused on that one grade level and milestone, and we're going to delve deeply into our student achievement outcomes and what that looks like for us. So I, I'm so excited about it because we said that the... Um, Pathway to College Career and Community Readiness would be our outward-facing accountability tool in which we would talk about the academic milestones in that tool. And so today, be able to bring a presentation to talk specifically through that lens will be very um, important. So thank you so much, and I think I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Pugh at this point. Thank you, Dr. McKnight. 
Um, next slide, please. I'm really excited to be here with the team because as we go through each of these milestones in the pathway, um, it's really important that we're extremely clear on what it's measuring, what it's intended to measure, how we're using it, so that parents and caregivers can really um, benefit from the information in a way that can be helpful to them and in their schools. So um, in addition to the district level data that the team will share today, you also receive the disaggregated by school level data um, in advance alongside of the slides. Um, one of the pieces that is important to note about this assessment as Dr. McKnight shared is that Map R and Lexile score are different things, and so the team is actually going to go through and be very specific and intentional around the measure that's in the milestone, which is Lexile. We'll share the overall data of the district in the aggregate and then also disaggregated and then talk about some next steps. Next slide, please. So hopefully this is a vision, a visual that's becoming familiar to you. And as we uh, move through highlighting each of the important milestones, uh, today we are on reading by grade three. Uh, the reading by grade three is something that has been in history for a long time. We've all, all talked about the importance of being able to make sure that you're reading on grade three in order to be able to access the content that really starts rich in grade three and four and five. So at this point, I'll turn it over to our experts, uh, starting with Ms. Brown. Thank you, Dr. Pio. Good afternoon, Dr. McKnight, Ms. Silvestri, members of the board. Um, my name is Malika Brown. I'm the elementary ELA supervisor. Um, so if you remember, on September 7th, we shared information re um, regarding our early literacy data. And as part of that discussion, if we can go to the next slide, we highlighted the five components of reading. So those five components that we know are essential, um, what instruction needs to be in order to develop skilled readers. Today, as we discuss our grade three, it is important for us to note that each of these areas of instruction are essential in preparing students to be proficient readers by the end of grade three. So we can use the analogy of a strong, well-built house um, when we think of what it means to be a proficient reader. So there are essential components that are dependent upon each other. So first, we need solid ground, right? That is our oral language development. Um, on top of that, we have the beams of our house, the foundation, foundations before beams, which is our phonemic awareness and our phonics. In order to keep going, um, once we have the foundation, we think about the beams, that is our fluency and vocabulary. Um, the vocabulary development, which is that continued language development. From there, we have the roof of our house. That is the comprehension. Without all of that, without the strong foundation, without the beams, our house is compromised. That's what it means when we're thinking about uh, reading by grade three. Um, so for our students that are in our primary grades, it, it's critical that they also have the foundation around those foundational skills that are necessary going into third grade in order to read proficiently. If we can go to the next slide. So again, when we're thinking about what does it mean to read proficiently by third grade, um, our students are able to, to read a wide variety of texts and be able to respond to text-dependent questions. This involves a lot more than just lifting the words off the page or knowing those words. It has to do with them comprehending and understanding what is being read and utilizing that information. Students, they need to be able to monitor their understanding of the text um, while they are reading, and they need to be able to utilize those critical strategies in order to, um, you know, uh, when they're, if they come across something that's confusing, um, in order to infer the author's message or the, infer the author's intended purpose. Students are required to have adequate background knowledge and vocabulary about the topic in order to, again, to infer the author's message and the point the author is trying to communicate. The only way that our teachers can ensure that this is actually happening in the classroom is if the student is able to demonstrate their learning and understanding of the text, either through writing and responding to those text-dependent questions or engaging in classroom discussions and discourse with their, um, with their classmates. Um, proficient readers, some of the things that they are able to do with the text, um, and again, by thinking about by, that by 
thinking about by the end of grade three. Um, they have to be able to decode and pronounce unknown words. Um, they have to be able to define new words either within the context or looking at parts of the words. Um, they have to be able to interpret, it, interpret figurative language, um, uh, using predictions um, to refute or make their own conclusions, draw conclusions, summarize the text, and then reread different portions of this text. Those are the things that they do to demonstrate that they have a clear understanding or they're reading proficiently by grade three. If we can go to the next slide. As both uh, Dr. McKnight and Dr. Pugh mentioned, we use the MAP-R, Measures for Academic Success, me Measure for Academic Progress, sorry, mixing of things, um, reading as our measure. It is an untimed assessment. So that means that students are, um, they begin the test and they're given the amount of time that's necessary in order to complete it. Um, it also is adaptive. Adaptive tells us that it all begins at grade level. So students engage with grade level text and grade level questions. Depending on the accuracy of their responses, the assessment um, either increases or decreases in difficulty. And so that's the, the portion of being that adaptive component. As you may remember, um, our K-2 assessment, the Dibbles assessment, it does have a comprehension subtest, but it primarily focuses on our early literacy measures, those foundational skills. Whereas our MAP-R assessment, the focus is around comprehension. It does not measure early literacy or foundational skills. It goes on the assumption that students already have those strong foundational skills in place and then measures the comprehension um, in alignment with the vocabulary development as well. When a student meets the third grade milestone as measured by MAPR, we can anticipate again that they have those necessary skills to be able to access the content and access the skill and access the assessment and demonstrate proficiency in, in reading. Um, and this is it isn't even dependent on content areas because we know that across all content, proficiency is dependent upon being able to read proficiently. If we can go to the next slide. So one of the things that we're often asked, well, how do we know that a student is reading proficiently? Well, the MAPR assessment, it produces a Lexal score. The Lexile, it measures the complexity of the, of the text, um, and MAPR provides that level for us. It gives us a Lexile score, and that's how we determine whether or not a student is, is able to read proficiently because what they're able to do with the text and the text-dependent questions that are um, in the assessment. Students are assigned that score, and it's done because the test predicts the text that they're reading and, um, and that, they, that they, it, it shows that they are able to um, read the text independently with an appropriate level of challenge. So what we call, it the, essentially, it's the sweet spot. It has a fair amount of difficulty, but the student is also able to read it with some, with some success. If a student's Lexile score is below grade level, that indicates to the teacher that the student would need additional support in order to engage in grade level text. If their Lexile score is above grade level, that indicates to the teacher that the student um, would benefit from ongoing and continued enrichment. If we can go to the next slide. So before we take a further look at um, the, the data as it relates to the milestone, we just wanted to spend a moment to acknowledge the unique experience that our current fourth graders, last year third graders had. These students, they entered their kindergarten school year 2019-2020, and in March were sent home to continue the rest of the year online. They started their first grade year, that 2020-2021 school year, completely online. Some returned to school in March to a very different in-person school environment. And some of them remained at home to continue that first grade year online. For third, for second and third grade, um, most returned to buildings. Uh, their in-person experience, again, it was very different um, due to disruption in staff and students having to quarantine. Um, we were wearing masks, um, social distancing, uh, reduced use of manipulatives due to the social distancing. So over distancing. So overall, a lot of different COVID um, disruptions. 
We also know that some of our populations of students were highly impacted, a lot more impacted than others. Some communities um, refused to uh, return to in-person learning. What that tells us is this particular group of students, they miss the shifts that we made around instruction in K-2 with that focus on explicit, systematic, cumulative instruction around foundational skills. When we consider the five components of reading, we have to remember that they didn't get that. The shifts that we were making around instruction, we began um, really looking at our K-2 instruction and these students were already in third grade. So they were not only were they home, not only were the disruptions, but they also did not benefit from the shifts that we were making with that focus on K-2 and the instructional implications and the approach that we made. All that to say, just as a reminder, that our milestone for reading by grade three is not only a measure of the teaching and learning that's happening in grade three. It's reflective of teaching and learning from K to three. The data that we are going to review is why we're making that shift. It continues to illustrate our urgency to ensure that every single classroom across our district, that the instruction is reflective of what the research tells us about how children learn to read. It goes back to um, what I mentioned earlier around that having that solid foundation for, of our house. If we can go to the next slide. So uh, again, as Dr. McKnight mentioned, this is the first year that we are looking at our data, reading by grade three, through the lens of the academic milestone. While, and she also shared that while we have the percents on the slide, you also received a handout that included um, the percent as well as the numbers um, for by race, ethnicity, and service groups for each one of our schools. So as you can see um, on the slide, 59% of last year's third graders met the grade three milestone. And so that's about 11,441 third graders from last school year. We can also see that our gaps continue to persist, um, as you can see across our um, race and ethnic groups. And we- Just a quick question, where yes. is that handout? Um, it was not on board docs, correct, Ms. Van Dyke? No. It should have been with part of. Yeah. Okay, well, we just get, we'll get, get it a copy for here. you, but yep. yes, and it should be on board docs. And when you see it, you'll see that it does have the information for every single school um, by race, ethnicity, and service groups. I apologize for that. Um, and so, when we, again, when we look at our, particularly our, our black and brown students, we continue to recognize, acknowledge that Again, during those critical K to two years, um, many of you know these students did not return to in-person learning. Were not comfortable with returning to in-person learning, and were heavily impacted by the pandemic. From here, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Wiles to continue to look um, and share additional data and information. Good afternoon, um, President Silvestri, Dr. McKnight. Next slide, and board members. This slide represents baseline Lexile benchmark data for third graders who are our emergent multilingual learners, our students who are eligible for free and reduced meals, and our special education students. Later, we'll discuss what we're doing to assist students who are not meeting the benchmark. With regards to students receiving English language development services, we wanted to note that as students are developing English language skills, they're increasingly meeting the benchmark. As we examined the data of our emergent multilingual learners, we saw that students who were higher in their English proficiency were more likely to meet the benchmark than students who are in the beginning stages of English proficiency. For example, the, uh, the third graders who are um, reflected in this data, um, of that group, there were 259 emergent multilingual learners who were at a level four, or expanding language development level, in their English proficiency. Of that 259 students, 83% of them were able to meet the benchmark. This is a testimony to what we know about language acquisition, in that when students have enough academic language under their belt and in the language of assessment, they can and do perform at high levels. It also speaks to what we know about the length of time it takes for students to solidly acquire language skills 
<clears throat> with appropriate support in place and grade level instruction. It's also important to note that the data only on this slide only represents third grade students receiving special education services who are pursuing grade level outcomes and, a gra and graduating with a diploma. So this doesn't reflect our, um, the data for our students who are on alternative learning outcomes um, working towards a certificate. The map R Lexile information is used to inform classroom instruction for our students with disabilities. We use the data to plan, to, to develop, <clears throat> revise IEPs in order to write appropriate accommodations, goals, and objectives for our students. Next slide. Since the map R assessment is administered three times per year, one of them being the fall, through collaboration with our school-based reading specialist teachers, including our general and special educators and our ELD teachers, we're able to use that data and information gathered to determine actionable next steps for the continued progress, enrichment, or acceleration of students across all racial, ethnic, and service groups. One of the next actions we will take is to gather more data to isolate the component of reading that is compromising the reading process for some of our students. For students not meeting the Lexile target, we administer, administer the Dibbles assessment in order to target the areas of need regarding foundational skills um, for instruction. And now I'll turn it over to Ms. Hewlett. Good afternoon, uh, Dr. McKnight, uh, Ms. Silvestri, and members of the board. My name is Tamara Hewlett. I am the director of the Department of English Learners and Multilingual Education. And if we could go to the next slide, please. And I am going to talk to us a little about what the parents uh, see and what they can do with the information that they receive. So on the screen, what we're seeing is a report uh, called the MAP Student Progress Report. This report is sent home after each administration of the MAP assessment. And as indicated, you will see that it will share a student's overall Lexile range. Um, and uh, families can use this information to identify the appropriately challenging books and other reading materials that they can use for their, for, for their child. Um, it's important that to note that um, the, the district level provides guidance for schools to really review this report uh, with families, um, especially when parent conferences are coming up, uh, so that parents can have a better understanding of what the report actually means and um, under, an understanding of where their student falls uh, in, in relation to other students. As part of the additional support with interpreting the, the information on the student progress report, schools do receive uh, information regarding how the Lexile score correlates to reading on, above, or below grade level. Teachers also get a specific report as well uh, to help provide targeted, uh, targeted services to students based on where they fall uh, in the Lexile range. Next slide, please. And as we talk about what we're doing to uh, shore up our students' reading comprehension, uh, we just want to remind uh, everyone um, some of these actions are actions we shared at the first uh, meeting when we talked about Dibbles, but we just wanted to reiterate. As a reminder, this past summer, all K-5 teachers, including our English language development teachers, were able to attend uh, some uh, professional learning on foundational skills and the overall components of reading instruction. And so while our third through fifth graders demonstrate that their uh, learning through vocabulary and comprehension pillars um, while they demonstrate that, it's evident that we need to do some more work for them uh, in those areas. And so um, uh, our vocabulary and comprehension work is going to be um, targeted work that uh, schools and reading specialists are going to be supporting schools with. As we continue our shift in instructional practices, we're committing to ongoing direct support to schools and ongoing professional learning. Additionally, the school-based reading specialists are going to collaborate with teachers of students who are not meeting the benchmark uh, to identify goals for the students and determine explicit instructional support um, in order for students to reach the goal. So these plans need to be culturally relevant, 
asset-based and informed by a range of factors, including a student's interests, uh, English language proficiency, or disability or impact of disability if applicable. Uh, central office staff members from the pre-K-12 uh, instruction team, uh, the Department of English Learners and Multilingual Education, and our Office of Special Education are available to support school teams with instructional planning, data analysis, and job embedded coaching. And as we shared at the September 7th board meeting, based on our literacy data, we have 82 schools who uh, received the reallocation uh, or a new allocation for that paraeducator uh, support, um, where they're going to focus on literacy in grades K through three. And so these paraeducators will receive ongoing training and support throughout the school year to ensure that instruction um, is solid and provide students with explicit, systematic, and cumulative instruction. And further, for our, we know that our emergent multilingual learners, uh, we have to have a sense of urgency around the work that we're doing with um, our students. And so providing culturally responsive grade level instruction that does not compromise access, opportunity, and success simply because our students are adding English is pivotal and is going to be key to the work that we do. Our ELD teachers, our English language development teachers, continue to provide designated language development services with oral language development, and as Ms. Brown described it, the foundation. Um, that's the foundation of, of the house that we are building for our students. So they're going to continue their designated language development services with that as a key focus uh, and a critical component of their development. And we're also continuing to build content teacher capacity as they work to integrate language development supports and scaffolds during core instruction. And so at this point, I'm going to turn it over to the board members so that we can have our discussion. Okay. Board members, please turn your lights on so um, I can call on you, Ms. Rivera Oven. Yeah. Thank you so much for that, and thank you for, oh, my glasses are on top of my head. Um, thank you for providing that data, but I am very visual, and I'm trying to, I'm not a dare guru, um, but I love data. Um, so I'm trying to understand what this means, and I'm looking specifically at a school. I mean, this is public knowledge, right? This. Anybody can look at this. It will be on board docs after, on board this, docs, right? after this meeting. Okay. It is. It is. Oh, it is. Oh, okay. 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 So it's on board docs, yeah. Okay. So help me if you, like, I'm looking at Daily Elementary because that's one of the schools that I work very closely with. And I'm trying to understand the data. And when I'm looking at it, am I reading it right that there's no special ed kits? education at daily elementary, but there is a percentage there. Like, I'm just trying to understand, like, if I were to read this, I'm trying to understand the breakdown. And this is all up to third grade kids. This is all third grade students right. at daily. Right. But there are suppression uh, limits applied to the data where individual students could potentially be identified. Dr. Addison, is it five or 10? It's 10. So it has to have at least 10 in that grade level in order for the data to be, to be an end size. Ah, OK. All right. Sorry. I, I, I apologize. But that, that, that makes now that makes sense. So if I look at that, am I seeing this right, that the overall of the total kids, they're 92, and that is 32.6% have met that level of reading? satisfactory, right? And then if I go, um, so there's no data for Asian students because it's less than 10. Okay. So then if we move to the next column for African American kids, um, 28 and 50% of them have met the, the reading data, which is much better than the whole. Yes. Okay. Then if, when I move to the Latino kids, there's 52 of them, and only 19.2 have made that, that 
that benchmark. Yes, that's accurate. Okay. And then I keep going. And then you have the farms kids, 71 in third grade, and only 23.9 have met the benchmark. Okay. And if I keep going, the English multi learners, which formerly known as ESOL kids, that was me, um, 42 of them and only 16.7 have met the benchmark. Okay. So what are we doing about it? I guess that's, that's. You know, I knew you were going to ask because I saw you studying diligently while she was saying what we were I doing just, about yeah, it. I'm just really, really I, and I'm just using that as an example to make sure that, uh, and also folks know how to read it, but there's such a huge disparity there, and you were talking about additional sources and so on, but, um, and there's, it's very small, so that's, that's all I can do, but there's some other schools that even have lower percentages with a large percentage of, of, um, of children in that category. Um, and so it, this speaks to, again, the shift that we're making. Um, in, in K-2, we were able to make a, a real transformative shift implementing really great reading to support our foundational skills in K-2 because we know, again, those foundational skills, it's, it's what everything else is built on. Um, we rec recognize and acknowledge that our students, we have students in grades three to five who also need that additional support and foundational skills. So Ms. Hewlett shared, um, depending on how a student scores, you know, for this school year, depending on the student score on the map, a student in grades three to five, how they score on map R, they, teachers will also administer the Dibbles assessment so that we can have an understanding of where those gaps are around phonemic awareness and phonics. Um, so the teachers can then provide that additional support in, in, in instruction. What this data tells us as an initial, the MAPR assessment when we've received that Lexile score is there's a breakdown somewhere. Um, students are not able, they're not demonstrating that they are, can read the text at grade level proficiently. And so what we need to do, um, what teachers need to do is to determine why, what is the breakdown? Is it around word recognition or is it truly around language comprehension? Um, and so that's where, that's why the Dibbles assessment is one of the, the next steps that we're supporting schools um, and teachers with taken. We were able to provide training this summer, um, not only for our continued training for our K-2 teachers on how to administer the assessment, but we were also able to provide that for our three to five teachers so that they can administer it. Once they have that information from the assessment, there's different things that they can put in place. Um, Dibbles, it comes with different activities that can be done, different lessons that can be done in support of the foundational skills. Again, supporting students with developing the word recognition that is necessary in order to decode the words in text. In addition to that, we've also um, working with the Office of Special Education to implement different interventions. Students in three to five, outside of their core grade level instruction, they can also, if, if necessary, they can have interventions in really great reading or in Gillingham, UFLY. So there's different things that we're putting in place in order to support students. The other piece, and I'll speak briefly about it when we're thinking about our emerging multilingual learners, it's the importance of that oral language development. And so working with the reading specialists, working with the classroom teachers, working with our English language development teachers to ensure that we're building oral language development so that they can make those connections to, to text. And as it pertains to uh, emerging multilinguals learners um, specifically, we have to, one, not see our students as void of information. They have a lot of language. It's just not in the language that we are assessing them in. Um, and so working with our teachers to ensure that we're doing a lot of meaning making because, you know, attaching meaning of this English word to a concept I may already know in my first language. Um, that's the kind of uh, mindset shifting we are uh, working on with our content teachers. They are not blank slates. They come with a lot of language and a lot of knowledge. And how are we building that bridge in order to provide targeted language development um, and meaning making so they can attach the meaning to the grade level content that they're learning. Um, so our ELD teachers will continue to provide designated instruction. And so those are language supports 
of the grade level. So we don't want to not provide uh, and widen the gap by pulling them aside and, you know, doing basic uh, language development. There's a, there's, there are ways to provide those supports uh, in connection to the content that they're learning, um, understanding the language structures, understanding, you know, the meaning of, a, of the sentence in the context of the content. So our English language development teachers will continue to do that um, and that we are working feverishly with our um, content teachers and our, our school supports, um, you know, as evidenced by the training we provided this summer where we had all ILT members uh, engaging in professional learning around things like the key language uses uh, from the WIDA uh, consortium um, and understanding how to integrate content and language. And so it's going to be um, our task as we go out into schools to see that learning transfer to action. Um, and we're, we're constantly working with our school partners to ensure that that happens. Ms. Harris and then Ms. Ms. Uh, Evans. I was just going to add, just Go ahead, quickly. quickly yeah. um, in the Office of Special Education, we created a specially designed, un specially designed instruction unit last year, which was a mighty office of one. Um, we did some reorganization. She has a um, staff now. And so we're working directly with schools to provide training on specially designed instruction to work with students inside the general education class, outside of general, general education class, as well as work with our um, students on alternative learning outcomes. Ms. Harris? Yeah. Um, yeah, a couple questions. And um, sort of getting really back to a basic question for me. When we say focus on reading by grade three, reading by grade three, wh what does that mean? Does that mean that a student is at grade level for grade three content? Is there another definition that we have when we say what we're looking for is that students are reading by grade three? What, what do we mean when we say that? Um, earlier, as we were explaining what Lexile is, so Lexile is the number that comes when the student takes the map R, but it is also an indicator of books that a student can read that, or text Complexity. that they can read that is at grade level and appropriate for them. So they have done a study that matches Lexile to grade level. So for us, um, grade level means that they can be successful with the language, reading, and being able to respond and make meaning at grade level standards, right? And so some of the skills that were listed means you already need to be able to decode and pronounce new words. Some of the other things, um, defining words based on the context. So there are specific skills in third grade that equate to a grade level. Lexile measures complexity of the text yeah. and the ability to access it and read it successfully and comprehend it. And that is, there are a number of sub skills that are required in that. So it's a pretty big level understanding of Lexile. Uh, it's a widely used measure in the South. It was started by libraries to be able to match students to books, but then a lot of work was done that was very helpful to families, that was helpful to be able to go to the library and go to a section that was already leveled that your child could pick from. And then more additional scientific study, and I think Dr. Addison has done research around this area too, or participated in it, um, to say that if you can read at X level, um, that equates to a grade three. Okay, yeah. so, um, and what I'm, I think I'm remembering accurately from the presentation we had a couple of meetings ago when we were talking about divils of data. Um, so they take the map bar three times a year, and the, but the divils assessments, those are shorter, more frequent tools or assessments used by instructors throughout the the this, the year. So they're they're not really formalized in the way we think of a map bar. But they're they're being used on a more ongoing basis. So in this case, the all of them the th are administered three times a year. Recommended that winter administration, um, but they're done formatively, right? As a check to see where students are at that time in the year. And so for students, as Ms. Brown said, who are saying consistently their data say that they're below, we're recommending more frequent assessments to be able to see is there progress. So it might be okay. the more frequent assessments are on dibbles because that's where the skill breakdown was. So as they're working with students doing targeted interventions, 
the retest would be in, the, in Dibbles. They'll come back and do a winter assessment to be able to see has that made a difference. And so the, I, I'm sure the expectation is that they use the result, what they learn from these assessments to, to modify instruction. Yes. Um, so when we look, because I'm, you know, looking at the attachment and the the um, spring grade three um, reading data f from this past year, wildly divergent numbers. So when we when we're looking at this and we're looking at these assessments three times a year, what? And, and I hate to use the word expected or average or that kind of thing, but just give, given any group of students whatever level they're, they're at, what do we expect to see growth-wise from assessment to assessment if we're looking at these three assessments as the year goes along? So wherever they start, what, what amount of growth are we expect, expecting to see so that we know when things aren't yeah. going well. I, I understand what you're yeah. asking for. Unfortunately, it's not a clear uh, measure that goes by nice and neatly by 200s um, because the measures as they're correlated with grade level are not that precise. Um, so it's it, there are expected growth measures that you get in the RIT score, a different score, because this, this what we're talking about today on the milestone is one single score yeah. administered one time. Right. And it, what it does is say a student is, is ready or a student needs more support. And that data point then get as, says get more data about what the, what the concern is. Yeah. So there are predictable rates of growth, but they differ grade to grade. That okay. makes sense. Uh, yeah, it does. It does, actually. And so I guess what I'm thinking, what I'd be really interested to see, um, and I w I'm sure we will be, are this year's third graders and how they are performing as we are rolling out the science of reading and we're doing much more professional development around this work. But also, so the concern is we look at the, you know, third graders from last spring and where s some were, but they're not third graders anymore, they're fourth graders. So even if they weren't at grade level, we move them on to the next grade level. And so looking at how those students are doing as this year goes on, are they catching up? Are they accumulating those skills? And if not, what are we doing about it? So that's the kind of thing that I'm going to be really, really interested to see as, um, you know, as we move through this year. Thank, thank you. you. Ms. Evans? Sure, thank you. Um, so my question is, we heard about what teachers do when they get the Lexile numbers and trying to determine what they should do next with our students. Can you talk a little bit or walk our families and community through what that data, how that data triggers our directors and or area associate, area associate superintendents to help support the schools. I know you mentioned at the very end, and I, um, I can't remember if it was Ms. Brown or Ms. Hewlett talked about that there's support that's provided to the schools, but families don't know what that looks like and they don't know the intentionality behind that support. But can you give a little like if, if it's if it can be brief, like what that looks like for schools, because you can tie it back to some of the schools that might need some additional support where you see the numbers for our students are um, as high or in the um, range that we would like for it to be. Right. So thank you very much for the question. So those students that we are talking about today tested at the end of grade three will we'll test again in grade four at the beginning. And there are some associates who are super excited about that data drop. I don't know if they're here and in the audience, but it has become part of their routine protocol, right? Because when you align the school improvement plan with improvement in math and reading, um, depending on the school and depending on the level, there are different data points that they can use to monitor progress all along. And that is one of the questions when they go out. What, what support is needed? How, how did your students do in, the, uh, in reading on their Lexile when they came to fourth grade? What additional information do you need? Do you need teachers trained if they weren't able to do the really great reading training? So that's when we can be much more prescriptive. Um, so right. first, triggered by that conversation, we're also looking at the data and deploying resources through the instructional specialists, but I'll let uh, Ms. Brown share that part. 
And just to briefly add, that is the partnership um, between the Office of Pre-K-12 Curriculum and OSSWB, um, working with the directors, working with the learning achievement specialists in tandem with the instructional specialists to analyze that data and support schools with determining, uh, drafting their school improvement goals around literacy and math in addition to the other goals, and using those goals to drive the support to schools. The work that we do with reading specialists, we have it coming up. So thinking about your literacy goals, this is what your data looks like um, last spring. This is what, you know, hopefully we'll have our beginning of the year data by then. And so these are the groups of students that, you know, need that additional support. What is the plan? What is the plan around professional learning? What is the plan around your tier one instruction? What is the plan around your supplemental instruction? And us providing that coaching and support to schools. Right. And I know we've talked about this at other board meetings, but it, it just helps to remind families along with this presentation what they do do. And um, I don't want and you correct me if I'm wrong, I don't want people to think that the schools have to reach out to ask for that support, that people are looking and thinking to provide that support um, to our schools at the same probably at the same time that they're maybe thinking to ask. Um, uh, so the, and my other thing is this, you know, as we get into every budget cycle or season, we don't know what we're going to have to protect, but we do know that resources are very valuable. And as um, some of our students might need various interventions, I know that people know that um, at some point um, we'll have to, and we've already had to begin to think about how we're doing less with the tutoring are there any other ways that um, we are trying to support our students that we can let our families know? And then, and I'm not trying to put an extra task on teachers, but is there is there a way to, or has there been thought, and they may be doing this, that you talked about the teachers can take the Lexile scores and determine where the students are at for their reading and what reading materials they may need. Is there a way that we can use Remind to let parents know like what books their kids should be looking at or are we doing this when they do the, um, the reading nights and things like that? I was just trying to think about how we can not putting it on the parents, but how parents could also provide support at home if they don't know how to, I mean, you get those forms at home. Some people don't know how to read it. They don't know what it means and they don't know how to support their kids. So I ask like quite a few things all in one, but that's just my thinking around. Um, right. I, I understand. And I think what would be important for people to know is that first of all, these data points are accessible on their um, parent view if they're a person who uses parent view um, they're also you know able to have hard copy if they're not on parent view but it should be a centerpiece in the discussions with the classroom teacher in any kind of conference or um, conversation about what supports are needed um, on the on the actual list there is a recommendation of texts that are at that level but it's okay. also publicly available in public libraries if you just say I need a lexile range of between two and three hundred um, but yes I think in school is our is our best lever. First of all, the best thing that we can do in terms of equity is making sure that all students have access to grade level instruction. Mm -hmm. Can't be stressed enough, right? We can't, uh, because they're scoring below, doesn't mean they can't uh, achieve in the thinking needed to help them develop the competency in reading. So it's having them in grade level uh, instruction with scaffolds as appropriate, but also treating whatever it is that they need if they're missing in their phonics or uh, uh, phonemic awareness or a particular set of blends. So being able to make sure that they have additional time out either in that reading block in their small group specific time, the teacher is attentive to those things. And, and that's the differentiated instructional approach that we're really committed to doing across all of my offices to make sure that teachers are supported in how to do that and what to use specifically. What strategies do I use for my students with disabilities through specially designed instruction? What resources do I have? Same thing with um, students who need additional support learning their second language. What supports are, the, are there and available? So I want parents to feel confident that we are attending to it in school, during school, while we have the children, because that's what we're committed to doing. 
In addition, we're working with um, many community partners to stand up additional supports beyond the school day. Um, in many of our elementary schools, we have uh, different community partners through our community schools efforts who are available and there as needed for the tutoring. So there's a lot of individual school-based tutoring that's going on or support. We call it, we're calling it learning supports at this point to be able to help um, parents who need help. I, and I would encourage parents who are, are either have questions about what this means or see their child's number and it's different or below what's on our milestone, that is the point to then say to the teacher what what needs to happen, what does this mean, and what's available for my child. I think I got many of them. No, no, you did. And, no, you did. Um, just a plug for our attendance, right? If the kids are not in school, they can't benefit from this fabulous in-classroom instruction that you are talking about. So we need families, we need our kids in school every single day. Uh, Ms. Wolf had to excuse herself. She wanted me to, to announce that she's trying to make a, her grandchild's back to school night oh, event at six o'clock today. So she apologizes for having to leave early. Ms. Yang. Yes, uh, thank you for this presentation. Um, I know that this is the baseline year that we are collecting this data. For me, um, um, data is helpful and I would like to, because I know that uh, learning occur, right? Learning occur, growth occur. But I really would like to see that if our new initiative is giving us more growth, Okay, so for example, this is the year that we shift to structural literacy. So this is the data we have, okay. What I would like to see is if you are coming back in the spring or, or in the spring, now you have the fall data, then you have the winter data, then you have the spring data. Uh, I understand that at N NWEA's website, the risk score, there is a common growth from fall to winter to spring, right? What I really like to see is what was our past history? Okay, student growth 15 points writ uh, between uh, fall to spring. But now we have switched to uh, structural literacy. Are we able to say we're keeping the 15 point increase or we're getting 18 point increase? So I would like if you ever come back, we are able to say, um, and our new initiative giving us uh, 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 our return. So if you go back uh, to the NWEA website, it does have past uh, history, uh, growth history. So that will be very interesting to see if this is making an impact. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Roberta Oven, and then we can yeah, uh, move just on to the quick, next presentation. I am just curious, because I was looking at Gaysesburg Elementary School um, uh, results, but it's a dual, it's a dual program, correct? Right, so it's, right. So, so it's a two-way two immersion way. program. Mm -hmm. So, so when you do dibbles, you do it in English, or do you do it in the language of uh, the native tongue, for example? Do you mean map or dibbles? How about both? Map is in English. So for dibbles, math is, yeah, for dibbles. Uh, at a two-way immersion school, they do it in both English and in Spanish. For map, our Lexile, which is what this third grade, mm -hmm. this is in, an English measure at all schools. So you know what my next question is going to be, probably. Mm -hmm. well, go ahead. No, I think you no. Know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so my question is going to be so because do you see a difference in the percentage? Because this is about learning, word recognition, and so on. So is there a difference in the native language versus the English language in the results? Because if you do it you know, only in English in third grade, that may be, especially for our English second language learners, that in English they have limited recognition for those words. But in Spanish, they could have full recognition of those words. Yes, yeah, so for the MAPR, we only assess it in English, but we are also um, using other measures, other formative measures um, along the way in reading in both English and Spanish uh, in our two-way immersion schools. So we are seeing that our students are um, 
uh, able to demonstrate comprehension um, and vocabulary um, on both in both languages. Um, and on this measure, we, we do not have any data for on the Spanish side of, of the coin um, to be able to say, Lexile-wise, here's where the student is in Spanish, and here's where they are in English. Any reason why they don't do that? So while they're developing an additional language, right, and they have content knowledge, um, speakers of other languages, beginning in third grade, take a state test that is in English that tests their ability to read English and to respond in English. So I think you know part of the point of this is the accountability measures for them and for us over time will be in English, at this time, and may, and maybe you know future things will change. But for right now, um, our only um, accountability measure statewide is uh, can they perform on the English the reading literacy test in English. So, so well, and I mean it's. Um, it is just what the end of course exam is in the state, and that is what they offer. For us, I think in the TWI programs, we're looking at the value of both, right? To understand what the student understands and to be able to continue developing English. And if we're doing our jobs right, they will exit services and be bilingual. I mean, that is our goal, biliterate and bilingual. <laughs> So I want to thank you for this uh, great presentation. I love all the board engagement around this topic. I think um, we're really benefiting from uh, this in-depth dive into the, the, our data monitoring. So I greatly appreciate it and um, look forward to the next <laughs> presentation. So moving on to our next agenda item, um, more critical strategic <clears throat> levers uh, in order to see success for our the youngest learners, and that is uh, pre-K, pre-K expansion as a part of the blueprint pillar. So I pass it on to Dr. McKnight to get us started with this presentation. Yes, so thank you as the staff for coming to the table. I'll just give some brief comments and then turn it over to them. Um, today we're going to talk more specifically about the expansion of pre-K. Expansion of pre-K is important for a number of reasons. One, you know, it's one of the pillars within the blueprint, and so not only is this a priority here in Montgomery County, it's, it's a priority across the state. Um, the other thing is Montgomery County has actually shown a long history of investment in pre-K, and I think that has benefited us in so many different ways, um, ways that we know. The earlier students are able to get a head start on their education before they get into kindergarten, the better we can expect their performances throughout the year, and therefore we are not having as many conversations about closing gaps. Um, this program it includes general education uh, and special education pre-K as well as Head Start. Um, just a few data points I wanted to, to share. You know, we did see a decline in pre-K during the pandemic, but then we actually saw a rebound after the pandemic with a peak being last year when we had over 3,000 students in Montgomery County Public Schools enrolling back in our pre-K program. So we're back on the rise, one. Secondly, we've had a lot of conversation here at the table about the importance of those programs and where we place them. Uh, where we place them also becomes really important because we know that there are some, in some communities where we want to be able to use that lever more and we need to have enough locations to be able to provide them with that. The team is going to come forward and share some, some data around what that looks like. But Mr. Hull can attest to this. I've met with him and his team, and I've talked about the level of creativity that we're going to need to exercise in how we host pre-K. The fact of the matter is that we are not going to be able to build our way out of what we want to accomplish, nor will we be able to have all the money to do that. So we're going to have to start to think creatively, uh, creatively about this um, and how we do that. But today, I look forward to turning it over to you for the presentation and for there to be continued discussion about how we meet the needs of our um, earliest learners who are our pre-K students and getting them and their families into this program as soon as possible and making the program accessible to them. 
Thank you. So I'll just frame really quickly, um, in addition to what Dr. McKnight said, is that Montgomery County has a long history of providing for its earliest learners and that this is truly a county uh, initiative. If you look at the blueprint, the uh, what it calls for is a combined effort between county and public school system to be able to provide for our earliest learners. And those uh, requirements are listed out and there are many entities in the in the county who are working towards that that our team serves as members of their board and you'll hear more about it today uh, i think what's uh, important and you probably you know seth and i at the table at the same 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 place and time because what dr mcknight said is we don't have the space and so how are we going to be creative and how are we going to be able to meet the needs of our earliest learners? It is going to create a, or a need and does drive a need to have a very comprehensive plan in, in combination with the county. Right, so there are county parts of it that need to happen then there are MCPS parts of it that need to happen and it includes facilities, it includes staffing and teaching and uh, professional learning and instructional materials, and it includes transportation, data, transportation, yeah, food. All of those things are going to require a significant financial investment. And so this is phase one. We're going to share information about what Blueprint Pillar 1 means, but coming forward will be um, additional funding requests. So with that, I'll pass it over to the most talented team who knows everything there is to know about early learning. That's, That's you. Order there. <laughs> That's you. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Dr. McKnight, President Silvestri, and board members. My name is Nichelle Owens, and I serve as the director for the Division of Early Childhood, Title I, and Recovery Funds. Good afternoon. My name is Amy Kropp. I'm the director of Pre-K Special Programs and Related Services in the Office of Special Education. We are here today to share how Pillar 1 of the Blueprint has been implemented thus far, and we will also offer considerations for future expansion and implementation of Blueprint. Next slide, please. Thank you. In alignment with MCPS's theory of action, strategic plan, our academic pathways and milestones, and our anti-racist um, action plan, um, the early childhood teams are committed to school readiness, academic achievement, and pre-K well-being. Our teams do this by increasing access to full-day classes based on the needs of our communities. We also continue to build our staff capacity to provide services to families and to provide high-quality teaching and learning experiences to our youngest learners. We believe that if we do this well, we anticipate that our children will demonstrate readiness on the assessment administered at the beginning of their kindergarten year. Next slide, please. If we take a look at the pie chart, we see the total official enrollment as of um, September 30th of last year. That's, that's the official data. And that enrollment was 4,306 children. There are two things to note. First, notice the two distinct pathways for enrolling children in pre-K. One way to enroll children is through the pre-K Head Start office, and that is based on income eligibility. The second way to enroll your child in pre-K is through Ms. Crop's team, and that enrollment is based on individual education plans, or IEPs. Uh, students also identified with special services can enroll in that way. So when we look at the number 4,306, please note that that is the snapshot on September 30th. Our enrollment continues. We have ongoing rolling enro enrollment in both of our programs. So as Dr. McKnight mentioned, enrollment from uh, the Pre-K Head Start office actually peaked uh, in the spring to over 3,000. Turning our attention to the map side of the slide, you will see the location of our pre-K programs. And you'll see that they really go from Silver Spring up the corridor into Gaithersburg. We have a few sites up in uh, Germantown. You'll also note on the map 
that in many cases our two programs are co-located. And the co-location of pre-K provides opportunities for collaboration uh, between students who are receiving special services and our uh, pre-K Head Start classes. In the next few slides, Ms. Kropp will walk you through more specific details of pre-K classes for students receiving special education services. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, IDEA was reauthorized in 2004 and requires school systems to provide a range of settings and services for students who are identified as needing special education services through an individualized education program team process, including self-contained classes and inclusive classes, depending on each child's individual needs and determinations. And our services in special education are indicated solely by eligibility. Income is not a mandate. Income is not, uh, we don't even ask for students' income verification documents. The IEP is your sole criterion of eligibility. While MCPS serves children birth through age five, the blueprint asks us to prioritize four-year-old students as we expand to full-day classes. So today you'll hear more about our four-year-old expansion. Currently, pre-K students uh, receive services in nearly 60 elementary schools and two early childhood centers with a footprint in every cluster so that students um, receiving special education services have as short a bus ride as possible and many are served even in their home schools. Next slide, please. MCPS is proud to serve about 2,000 uh, students, four-year-old students with a variety of identified needs, including autism spectrum disorders, um, developmental delays, deafness, physical disabilities. And many of these children have been with us for many years, including before they turned three and sometimes at, you know, as early as birth um, with an identified delay um, in the Infants and Toddlers Program, which is our partnership between, MC between MCPS and the Department of Health and Human Services. Students come to us to pre-K special education services either as they transition from the Infants and Toddlers Program when they turn three or as they're identified after age three through the child find process. Data show us that the achievement gap begins very early and begin before kindergarten for students receiving special education services with about 15% of students receiving special education in pre-K demonstrating reg readiness on the kindergarten um, readiness assessment. So this gap is big. Uh, data show us, and we believe, that a full day pre-K experience for four-year-olds is what's going to turn the, turn the lever for us and help us to narrow this gap between children receiving special education services and their, and their peers. Next slide, please. So we're going to give a little history of pre-K and Head Start in the county. Historically speaking, the Head Start program has existed as, as a federally funded program uh, providing pre-K classes for children from families with low incomes in Montgomery County since 1965. Using the Head Start program as a model, Montgomery County committed local funds to establish what is now the pre-K program uh, with, an eligibility, with eligibility being the basis for uh, enrollment. I share this to emphasize the county government and MCPS's long longstanding commitment to early care and education. As you look at the timeline, we are highlighting key times when MCPS and the county government demonstrated a joint commitment to full day pre-K classes. And that started in 2007, 2008, when MCPS used Title I funding to make 15 of our schools, our Title I schools, have full day Head Start programs. And then in 2015, 2016, the state of Maryland started its pre-K expansion grant and MCPS used those state funds to increase the length of a handful of pre-K classes. We continued on a path uh, to full day in 2018 and 2019, we actually opened the Montgomery, excuse me, the McDonald Knowles Early Childhood Center where we serve 100 children um, in Silver Spring. And those, that was our opportunity to combine general education and special education services under one roof. 
A year later, we opened the Up County Early Childhood Center with the same model. And just last year, we used blueprint funds uh, to increase our number of full day seats. And we did this by converting part day seats because a number of the seats were part day. And then uh, we also created brand new um, full day seats. So our collective commitment with county government has positioned us as MCPS in a good position to uh, implement aspects of the blueprint for Pillar 1. Next slide, please. So we're going to jump into the blueprint at this point. Um, and here we're displaying the goals of Pillar 1, which is early childhood. And the main focus, honestly, is on expanding access. It's making sure that we have more full day access for pre-K students. You see the second goal is tied to that access and tied to attendance, right? It's tied to making sure that when children show up for pre-K, based on our theory of action, that we believe that there will be um, higher scores on the kindergarten readiness assessment, which is administered to all of our incoming kindergarten students. Next slide, please. MCPS has our own goal of eliminating the achievement gap among our children impacted by poverty, and we see how the pillars, uh, Pillar 1's goals fit very well into um, our goals. Next slide, please. So we've outlined the goals of Blueprint and how it supports MCPS's goals. Now we're going to provide some more foundational background information on the Blueprint. And we're going to start by discussing income tiers. The Blueprint has prioritized eligibility based on family income, as you see on the screen. Um, so families earning up to 300% of the federal poverty level are the priority for right now. And we verify income, we verify incomes during the registration process. And just to give you a sense of how much that is, that equates to uh, up to $90,000 for a family of four. This amount is adjusted, of course, for family size. Uh, new this year, we have some additional criteria for the tier one. And this was based on a lot of input from around the state. As you see those additional criteria below, they include students who receive special education services, students who are uh, from families experiencing homelessness, and students who are emergent multilingual learners. So when we report our tier one, tier one numbers for this year, we do anticipate that they will be higher. Thinking about next year, MSDE's timeline states that the blueprint will expand eligibility to include tier two families. We're still waiting for guidance on that, but we are expecting that to happen. So now we'll shift gears and talk about another component of the blueprint, which is the mixed delivery system. In the spirit of parental choice, the blueprint gives public funding to LEAs like MCPS and offers grant funding to private pre-K providers so that they can serve eligible children as well. Basically, this means that there's state funding coming to MCPS and state funding going directly to private providers who apply for said funds. At this time, MCPS has seven private pre-K provider partners, and they are part of this mixed delivery system that we have. They receive public pre-K funds, as I said, directly from the state, and they serve about 200 students total. MSDE's ideal state is for MCPS to have 65% of the share of children, of eligible children, and for our private providers to serve 35%. Based on the numbers I've shared today, our ratio is about 11 to 89, so we're not there yet, and we recognize this. To address this, uh, MCPS started the blueprint implementation by hiring a full-time, we, we, she's a central office teacher, but her job is to partner with our pre-K providers and to make sure that she's supporting them as the MOU states to support students with um, special services, to support 
children who are multilingual learners and also to support uh, families who or students who are impacted by homelessness. And she goes and she visits the sites. Um, but another part of her job is to do a little bit of courting to potential pre-K providers. And what we have found is that our partners, our potential partners, are just challenged with meeting some of the uh, requirements listed under the blueprint. So as an LEA, we know that we can't fulfill this part of Pillar 1 on our own, and therefore we have some partnerships, as Dr. Pugh mentioned. Um, one of those partnerships is a longstanding partnership with the county government, the Early Care and Education Initiative, which we call ECEI. Uh, they are charged with expansion, access, and sustainability of quality child care as it relates to school readiness gaps. We also are uh, members of the board for the Children's Opportunity Alliance, which is uh, newly formed, and as that alliance continues working on its strategic plan, we have charged ourselves with uh, making sure that um, we provide information related to the blueprint so that we can enlist them in recruiting partners for us. So we look forward to that continued collaboration with both of our entities to connect with potential partners and build a high quality and equitable early childhood system for children in Montgomery County. Next slide, please. What you see on the screen now is um, a visual representation of our pre-K model. And you'll notice that the family is at the heart of our pre-K model. This is where we really wrap around educational and family services. From an educational lens, our class ratios are listed on the screen. Uh, at all times, the classes are to have uh, two adults. And we also have a centralized registration process that actually starts in March, and it continues all the way through May um, with some really targeted seasonal support in March, April, and May. In addition to this, um, as a part of our model, we this is where Mrs. Kropp and I really connect, and that's on providing inclusive seats in our classes. So when you go to a pre-K class, you'll see 20 students, five seats are set aside, for students with special services or who receive special services, um, and so that they can be, again, collaborating with their peers. And then finally, we have a host of family supports, including our family service workers who support registration, work with families, and uh, implement family um, involvement activities. I'll speak to this slide from a special education perspective. While the goal is, goals are the same, to provide a high quality teaching and learning experience for children and provide important supports for their families, there are slight differences when we're looking from a special education lens. Earlier we discussed our charge to provide a continuum of services, so you'll notice that the class ratios in special education classes differ greatly, and IEP teams look at options and look at, you know, make determinations based on that. Students with more significant needs attend classes with fewer students and more adults, depending on their IEP team decisions, and parents and guardians are key members of those IEP teams. Uh, and you'll see the family supports uh, Pre-K special education has parent educators who are helping their parents navigate the uh, special education, navigate the school system, but also navigate the special education processes as they just join us in the school system, um, learning, those, learning through those processes. And they also provide formal and informal trainings and activities for parents and caregivers because we know that creating strong connections between home and school is really the trajectory to long-term family engagement. And rather than that centralized registration process that uh, general education pre-K Head Start families go through registration and enrollment into MCPS for students with special needs, it comes through either the child find process or as they turn three or later from the infants and toddlers program. So it's smooth through the, in, through the IEP team process throughout the year as children turn three or as they're identified and their parents bring them to child find teams as they develop concerns about their children. Next slide, please. So I think we've covered all of the salient points related to Blueprint. Now we're gonna take a look at what Blueprint expansion looked like last year. 
During our first year of Blueprint implementation, we used three funding sources to achieve more full day seats. As you can see on the chart, the Pre-K Head Start unit converted existing part day seats to full day and also created new seats. This increased our full day seats by more than 350 last year. One of the key takeaways is that blueprint funding alone may not be enough to fund expansion at a steady pace. Next slide, please. During the second year of blueprint implementation, which is this year, Blueprint funding did not increase for us. So knowing the need to continue to increase full day opportunities, we used federal funds to convert 10 existing part day pre-K classes in Title I schools to full day. We also are using some pre-K expansion grant funding from the state to fund uh, two classes and they are typically in newly established uh, schools or renovated schools because of space. And this school year, we've converted to full day classes for four year olds in schools where general education and special education classes are co located to align the students together to experience the full day of instruction um, in the same building co located. We have trend data that suggests that enrollment of students in special education services at the pre K level is growing consistently, so we will continue to experience um, just enrollment growth as we, even as we expand our models. Next slide, please. So our teams are really excited about the future of Blueprint expansion. Uh, we have some thoughts and some ideas that we want to share with you um, as it allows us to meet that full day need for our early learning classes that many of our parents honestly have requested. Um, and it also allows us to expand into communities where we currently do not have a president presence. Excuse me. And when I say we, I am referring to the pre-K Head Start unit. Uh, Mrs. Kropp's classes actually are in all of the clusters. Um, so this slide gives you our general thinking for expansion. Let's go to the next slide and take a look at some of our ideas. So one idea and opportunity is to ensure that each elementary school with a 50% ever farms rate has a full day pre-K program. And essentially, that farms rate equals up to 185% of the federal poverty, which fits into tier one. So it makes sense to expand into those schools that currently don't have a pre-K Head Start class. Next slide, please. And then thinking about our growth, we recognize that facilities is a challenge for us. We cannot, um, as Dr. McKnight said, we just can't fit into all of the spaces. Um, so to accommodate that rapid conversion and creation of full day pre-K in inclusive seats, we're thinking that the establishment of additional early childhood centers would be useful. And those centers, right now we have 100 children as the capacity. We're thinking if we expand that capacity to 300, we can really focus and uh, provide these collaborative supports between our two units. Next slide, please. Thinking about our expansion, uh, we've examined what expansion would look like within the next five to 10 years. And um, if we are, we are prepared to expand in alignment with our funding and capacity, and we've estimated the, the instructional cost of pre-K expansion to be about uh, between 83 and $88 million over time, okay? Additionally, those, um, there will be a need for cost for facilities. These costs actually represent instructional cost only. Okay. Next slide, please. Is it construction or instruction? Instruction. Thank you, not construction. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to speak to that. You're, it looks like Seth one. Yeah, Seth, Seth is ready. I'm going to cue him up, though. You ready, Seth? So at the beginning of the presentation, we shared that school readiness is our primary goal. The backbone of creating conditions for school readiness involves a high level of collaboration with our partners, our partners in district-wide operations and in the budget office. 
Over the years, our, our teams have collaborated with the Transportation Department, Division of Food and Nutrition Services, Materials Management, and the Department of Capital Planning and Facilities to build out new classes. As we prepare for expansion, we look forward to our continued and possibly enhanced partnerships with our operations team. The facilities department will be our first enhanced partnership uh, because we have to find a place for those students. So at this time, I will hand this over to Seth, to Mr. Adams, uh, who will provide facilities, a facilities outlook for pre-K expansion. Thank you. So, so actually, if we go to the next slide, this is just um, really uh, an elaboration of what Dr. McKnight talked about. So um, we have actually been talking about this for three, four years now from a capital perspective. Um, you know, two years ago as part of the CIP, we did a presentation, you know, really starting to think about, you know, pre-K, think about early education. Um, we've, we've worked with the, the various teams to overlay uh, areas of the county where we know, you know, there's, there's going to be great needs. Um, we've started to, to recapture some of the closed schools, um, so to bring more facilities into our inventory. Um, but that's just one piece, as, as Dr. McKnight said. So we're, we're looking at this from a perspective of what we can do uh, within MCPS, but we're also um, starting to have those conversations with, um, you know, other providers. As, as you know, part of our real estate program, uh, we work with a lot of different private providers. We try to, to bring um, as many into our closed facilities, not only for, for to serve our students, but, you know, as be part of the communities. Um, we're working with developers, really, to understand where development's going to happen. Can we take an opportunity to work through county partners to, to see where we can stand up different, different facilities? whether it be through us or through private providers. So I would say this is something that we've been, we've been talking about for, for quite some time. You will start to see more and more of it um, as part of the, the, the capital improvements presentations coming up uh, towards the end of the next month. But I just wanted to give that high level update um, of where we have been. The other piece to it obviously is, is really understanding how the state um, funding comes into it, particularly from the capital side. We, you know, obviously we talked about the operating side. Um, for, from our perspective, we know the county does not have the revenues to be able to just fund not both operating and capital, so really leaning on, on the state to see where we can partner with our delegates and our legislators to see how we can uh, firm up some of that, that state funding uh, to be able to, to support the growth here. Uh, and then obviously just really paying close attention to the, to the local funding and revenue forecasts. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, we, we talk about it at a lot of the different venues, we talk about it fiscal management, just really having a, a deep understanding of what's happening in our community uh, so that we, we can come at this from a well-rounded uh, approach and make sure that we, we are using the funds that we have as wisely as possible to be able to support um, this critical area of need. So, uh, again, more to come in the next several months as part of Dr. McKnight's uh, recommendations around the capital improvements program. But uh, just want to reassure everyone this is something that's been uh, on, on our radar for many years and, and something that we've been building out um, as part of, uh, uh, of a, a bricks and mortar approach um, for quite some time now. But thank you very much and we'll, we'll turn it over uh, to Ms. Silvestri for any questions. Okay, so, um, just a little bit more about the, the sort of are you saying that we'll, we will hear more about what the budget asks each year because you gave 88 million for the next couple of years but mm -hmm. are you saying that you're going to tell us more in terms of the details of what that ask will be every year or are you able to do that now not capital just uh, programmatic <laughs> so with me first um, so we're working on the programmatic and actually some of the work that is going to happen in the next month is really fine-tuning it to make sure that what we're planning and operating to cover teachers instructional supplies paraprofessionals takes into account what we'll need in capital to make that possible so CIP takes has a sort of a longer runway so our thinking basic math you know yeah. we would open some classrooms then a center and then classrooms then a center and a very logical um, but it, 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 after discussions, it's not likely to work out that way. So we're going to try and sit down and do a much more nuanced year-to-year -year plan where the first few years are, are likely to build expanding those half-day programs that currently exist um, and really looking towards uh, what is the next uh, closed school space or, or center space that we can design towards 
because then we will also need, we'll have time to do renovations, time to do uh, drawings, time to do all the work that needs to be done for the facilities, and we can plan. So it, we're projecting that it will look like it's a little slower in the first couple of years, and then when it hits CIP, we'll be able to move faster. How much was the budget amount in the last budget for pre-K expansion? Mm -hmm. What did you use in Title I? Uh, I would have to look that Sir, up. Okay, yeah, problem. We, that's okay. Ms. Harris? Uh, yeah, thank you for this. I really appreciate sort of the, the, the comprehensive approach that we're taking to this really important work. Um, first question, do we keep attendance data on our pre-K programs? Yes, there is attendance data for our pre-K. And generally speaking, what, what does that look like? Does it vary by community or, I mean, it, you know, if families have to be committed and actually bring their children for us to see the impacts and the results that we want to see. So, yeah. so you, you captured it right there. Um, there is attendance data. It does vary by community. Um, we do have, and, and we've been starting to monitor this data more with uh, our new, with our early warning system, excuse me. And uh, we are trying to implement and emphasize the importance to parents of having their children show up every day because with pre-K, it I mean, we just know that families sometimes, because it's not compulsory, that they, they, are, they may be more likely to say, oh, my child can miss a day. So um, we can get the data for our attendance overall. It was, um, it was quite high in the attendance press conference that we had. It was a problem area. Mm -hmm. yeah. Are we strategically, we're strategic, okay. Um, and then I, I have to say, you know, I, I look at the mixed delivery system, which is essential because we cannot do this work alone. And I'm concerned about the, the current imbalance and where we, we need to be. And um, especially when the goal is by, you know, in really just um, three years, we will be at a 50-50 delivery system um, to, accom to, to accommodate all of the, pre-K that needs to be, all the pre-K services we need. So I'm wondering the extent to which the imbalance currently relates to workforce development and a lack of qualified individuals outside the school system to actually provide those services. I think the, the barriers are numerous. Um, I think the certification is a new certification, and so higher ed wasn't quite ready to make that shift to have people go through that certification at the time. Um, and so the actual certification to be a provider um, is a barrier for, for our providers. The other barrier is parity and pay. So child care providers who then earn that uh, certification that in generally would come where they would have full-time benefits into the system, so they lose them once they've become certified. Um, there are other barriers, too. Um, the significant amount, and, and, and uh, Nichelle does a nice job because she does Title I in reporting and grant writing and uh, meeting and being evaluated, and so it is a lot. It, it takes a lot to have that happen. The other piece is um, the excels rating to, in order to be determined a high quality <clears throat> child care center. And that excels rating is, is things. It's having things in the centers that are used and available for the children. And so that's a cost. Um, so we can help technical assistance on how to um, get that rating and that's really what we'd like to do is partner with our um, providers to show them how and to help them with monitoring that how they apply for the grant how they can um, um, work through it but they have to see a cost benefit and right now for them the investment up front isn't yielding you know enough to be able to make that risk it is a summary of what I believe I have heard yeah. well and I would just say you know we have early childhood ed programs in MCPS so are we is your office working with those programs to, to encourage those students to actually think about early childhood ed as a, as a career, maybe funneling them into the associate's program in Montgomery College where they can get that certification and then be qualified? Absolutely. So not directly her office, but my office and, and uh, Ms. LaGrange, it, through the career technology and the dual enrollment programs, 
or technical education, and we recently had to make a shift, right? The old program was a child development program, and the child development program did not yield us with um, that type of uh, certification. So even if they took a praxis, they could become a paraprofessional for us, but they weren't licensed to actually go out and have a child care center. So there is a new pathway that is developed aligned directly with that, and Montgomery College has been more than gracious in learning how to uh, offer that certification. It is going to take time, though, um, because our students are just in the program now that has just transitioned to be able to meet that. So right. at least the next two years, um, before we have fully certified um, teachers. But, but we're growing our own. We are growing our own. Yes. And that is the best way, right? Yes. Because that, met, that mindset of coming back to serve and coming back to work with children, you see it all throughout Montgomery <laughs> County Public Schools as students who have gone through our programs coming back to um, serve in the schools. So. And just my last qu oh, go ahead. I will add one thing is that our teacher of the year, Shannon I know. of Clarksburg High Clarksburg. School, is a former, yeah. mm -hmm. proud to say former PEP teacher who yeah. left to, mm -hmm. with that in mind, and we talk frequently about her goals. Yeah, of it, it transforming that program into one that, yeah. I'm very happy. I was sorry to leave her in the PEP classroom, but I'm very happy that she yeah. went where she did. And I guess my last question is, do you have a sense of how much currently, where we, where we currently are with the number of seats that we have, how much demand ex exceeds supply? Right now we are estimated in terms of full day. Uh, we are about um, 90 or so percent full for our full day classes. Our part day classes less so, and that's because families want full day. Uh, last year was a good example of how in uh, the spring we had about 200 seats remaining that were part day seats. And this year we said, we're not even gonna have them. We're gonna convert those, all 200 of those to full day. So no, no waiting list is what you're saying. There is no waiting to, list. Okay. Oh, well that's good news. Right. And I'll say for the record that there's certainly no waiting list for special education services. We don't have a max capacity or, you know, we just keep up with enrollment growth. Mm -hmm. So there is no um, denial of services in any way based on it. You just made me think of my last, an, another question. Um, so class ratio is 20 to two. But what are the PEP classroom ratios? So the class ranges, and PEP is just one large part of the program. We also have um, comprehensive autism pre preschool programs. We have a vision pre-K class, a deaf, hard of hearing pre-K class. Um, so PEP is not the whole umbrella, but um, service classes range from about, I will say, six to eight students with one adult and two paraeducators for children with pretty significant needs. Um, some students are served clearly in a class of 20, um, 20 children to two, to a teacher and a paraeducator, and sort of the entire range in between. Um, it really is, it's hard to answer the question because it really is so individualized. But that's the big range of very small classes to a more typical classroom. Thank you. Ms. Trevetta Oven. Okay, I uh, have a few questions for you. Um, and actually, uh, I, th I think I had, um, I asked for a meeting in the future because I've uh, been trying to understand the process of how people actually sign up for pre-K um, because I had a few situations that were really sad where I had kids, um, parents who thought that their kids were enlisted and they had gotten the call, only that they were missing some paperwork and then by the time everything got, and these are, um, Nine English speaking um, parents, um, their their place in that classroom was already given away um, and filled by by kids from another cluster. So I, I'm trying to understand how that works. One, um, two, the process for um, EM, EML um, students. I'm trying to understand how that process works. You spoke about um, you have some family social services folks. Service, uh, yes, service thank you. Yeah, and I'm trying to understand how many how many of those folks you have, how many are bilingual. Um, I would like to know the list of the schools that could meet that the farms that n don't have pre-K right now. I would like to have a list of those schools uh, that you're thinking of. And um, and then um, 
you spoke about that you, we have partners in the community providing some of that. Um, I just like to have an idea who those partners are, demographically where those partners are. Um, and because I know the parents that I that I that I'm working with, they live in the up county. They had to take several buses to the office in Rockville. Um, some of them had to do four or five buses to get there to get the information. Um, and trying, it seems like it's a very different way of signing up your child than it is when you are trying to sign them up for a regular kindergarten or first grade. So it's a very kind of cumbersome uh, thing. And I just want to see what's the, the communication with the parents, especially with those that might not have Wi-Fi, that not have access to all those things. So if you can, and then the 4,000 plus kiddos that, that we have currently, I would also like to have a breakdown again of geographic area and demographics as well. Thank you. <laughs> Not right now, of course, but when you... wait time. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Sure, sure. Sure. Um, so th those questions are really for the pre-K Head Start unit, so I'll speak to those. The first is that that process for families signing up, we have started to streamline that process quite a bit. Um, I'll start with letting everyone know that right around February of every year, February, March, you'll see uh, ride on buses with signs on it that say register for pre-K. And um, we have started to go out into communities so that families don't have to go to Rocking Horse. I know that we, I see the, the, the cabs come to Rocking Horse with families. And I've heard the stories of families uh, saying, you know, that they've traveled. And when they do that, you know, I said, oh, you, you know you can do this online, right? Um, but in addition to being able to use Parent View to register online, which has been a huge upgrade, we make sure we're in communities. So we, we spent about three to four weeks at the Up County Regional Services Center with an open registration. We also had our uh, Rocking Horse Road Center open on Saturdays, again, to accommodate registration in the, in the spring. And we were also located in the Tacoma Park area for registration. Not only that, our family service workers, some of them uh, held their own mini registrations. And one of them I actually went to at the Plumgar uh, Community Center for registration. We didn't get a huge turnout. It actually was a really rainy morning and the afternoon was gorgeous, uh, but unfortunately not too many people came out. Our family service workers, they're a workforce of 32. Most of them are multilingual um, and they are dedicated. They, they go to communities to do registration. They have done registrations in shopping, um, and shopping centers uh, unofficially because parents say, hey, I, I need you to meet me here because I, so I can sign the paperwork. So there are opportunities for our, um, our families to connect with our family service workers. Um, I think if we could get, we could probably put together a report for all of your information so that everybody has the benefit of it written for them. We can follow up on those, is that okay? That's fine. <laughs> um, but can you can you answer my question about the placement of kids um, in the pre-K? How that works? Um, because by the time this little girl who who showed up the first day of school to ride the bus, and we had to tell her no, um, that she couldn't. And I know the principal was heartbroken. I said, "You tell her," because she was the cutest thing ever. Um, and by the time they f figured it out, they did have her paperwork. Mm -hmm. Her C was already given up to somebody else. And now she is on, um, I believe, a waiting list to have something nearby. So I'm trying to understand how, if, if we're talking about equity and balancing, um, especially working with high farm schools, then you could have a child who's not from a farm school go to that all-day pre-K, I'm trying to understand the dynamics. Oh, I got gotcha. you. Yeah. 
So um, first, when, when families have those experiences, and they are few, I mean, to be honest, we have registered 2,800 plus children. Um, many of those families call our office and our staff. We work to resolve it. I've actually been in contact with uh, three families this year who had that very situation. Um, so in those situations, the focus is not on the farm school, but on the income of the family, right? And so the income is what drives their access to the full day seat. Because we're not in all of the schools, there is a limited number of seats. And um, it is based on our family service workers placing them in those seats. So I would love to hear a little bit more about this student to see what we can do for the student because um, that's been our goal. When the problems come up, we certainly uh, work to address them. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you. Um, my only comment was in the, um, I think I heard you all in the briefing for the delegation say that this is a, a year when the blueprint law will be adjusted. Is that correct? Did I hear that right? For the tiers, or is this for something else? This may be for something that I'm not aware of. Is this a year when the blueprint gets adjusted? So the it law. can get adjusted any year. Okay. In any of the sessions, there are particular things that as districts and counties are looking at implementing that are problematic, and that if people can't make them, we're actually breaking the law. So there's a lot of advocacy okay. around, we need to change this or give some grace or change the timeline. They've done that since the beginning of the blueprint. Um, specifically to um, the sliding scale and, and moving that to where you can serve more children. Um, I think there's guidance that just continues to come out in, in pieces and rather unpredictably to be able to make sure that we're doing what we need to do. So yes, the law can be changed and it continues to evolve as guidance continues to be developed by the AIB. But this issue of the partners having barriers that they're not able to meet, is that being advocated for adjustments? Yes. We have talked about that. I know the AIB sessions that I've participated in, they, there has been a discussion about that imbalance, for sure. Okay, because we can't be the only one that's having this problem. We're not. <laughs> We're not. Okay, well, thank you so much. I don't see any other lights on or hands up, so... Um, Thank you for the presentation. We greatly appreciate it. Again, uh, pre-K is a key lever in our efforts to close the achievement gap, which we know begins in kindergarten. So thank you so much for your work. Thank you. I just also wanted to compliment the team in terms of we've been focusing on how we work across offices. And so this has really been a labor of love in which they've tried to bring the facilities and the instruction piece together. So thank you so much for your vision around that collaboration. Okay, moving on to agenda item number seven, consent items. I will ask uh, board members if they have any items that they would like to pull. Um, yes, uh, seven, four, seven, five, seven, six. Four, five, six. And we need uh, Ms. Rivetta Oven because we're gonna take a vote. Can I get a motion to move seven, one, two, and three in block? So moved. So moved. Second. Shepard. All in favor, raise your hands. And that is unanimous with those present. Okay. We want to start with uh, seven, four. Yes. Thank you. Um, yes, I did. I just wanted to pull this. Um, comprehensive maintenance plan, first time ever. This has now become my second favorite publication that this school system produces. Here's number one. Um, but I mean, I, I just wanted, I mean, I thought this was worthy of more than a hand raise during a consent item because this, where's Seth? There you are. This is transformative work that I think has been several years in coming. I think, Seth, you, Mr. Adams, excuse me, um, back when you first became director of facilities in 2019, spearheaded this, this wholesale management consultant review of how the facilities department did its work in schools centrally because there were a lot of inefficiencies and ways that 
we could you know, do more with less and work smarter, and this reflects that. And it is, this is a work of art. And I just, I just, I'm, I love this, and I'm just so excited about it. And again, I did want to call attention to it, because it does get to so many of the ways that we are trying to do our work in an equitable way to make sure every kid and every staff member every single day feels safe, welcome, and valued in a school that feels like a place they want to be. And this is, this is the kind of work and the kind of vision that will get us there, so. Miss, uh, where can we find that uh, for the public that wants to make it their favorite uh, <laughs> publication? Well, it's on, it's, it's, it's on board docs, but I don't know, where else can they get this wonderful document? Isn't it on the website? <laughs> yeah, isn't it? It's on the listed on the website. And Mr. Adams has actually talked about this. He said, you know, they send this uh, every year up to the, the state. And, you know, this, so we, we actually said it was an opportunity where it would benefit us to make sure that more people actually saw it and had access to it. So that, I'm glad you asked that question. Under which page in the website? <laughs> the facilities page. Facilities. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, 7.5? Um, yeah, I, uh, sorry, just wanted, um, I, and talking with several of my colleagues, shared the uh, interest in understanding more about um, what that Stronger Connections grant um, will do, how it will be implemented. <clears throat> Greetings, board members. Um, Damon Monteleone, one of the associate superintendents uh, in school support and well-being, and President Silvestre, Dr. McKnight. Um, so I'll, I'll start off and just give an overview statement um, on the grant itself. And there are three main components, and the components are around cybersecurity, so my colleague Chuck McGee is here, as well as um, combating hate bias. Uh, and then there's another piece about community partnerships and caregivers um, you know, in schools to provide support. So just to read the, the statement that was submitted with the proposal, uh, for, for you and the public, Montgomery County Public Schools will use the Stronger Connections Grant to implement three evidence-based activities that will directly impact wellness and safety for MCPS students, teachers, schools, and communities. As a result of ongoing engagement with stakeholders, data analysis, and system-wide needs identification, the Stronger Connections Grant activities will focus on cyber safety, combating hate, and parent engagement for positive youth development. Each of these activities seeks to disrupt negative behaviors, promote positive social, emotional, physical, psychological safety, and ensure that students are learning in environments that foster trusting relationships and provide services and supports to ensure student success. Give you a little bit more beyond that. This is a grant that runs through September of 2025. It is for $3 million. And it's really born out of the traditional Title IV grant. Um, and it is a, a component of that. And as we've said, it's, it's, a, it's focused specifically on safety and healthy environments for students. Um, so I'll speak a little bit more about the hate bias component, which is the part that I've been involved with. Um, we have a, a comprehensive approach to uh, combating hate bias and bullying. We shared some of that, I think, at a June board meeting in 20, uh, this, this past summer. Um, and we're currently deep into that work right now, and we put a lot of different pieces in place. Um, but this specifically for the hate bias piece would go towards professional learning, um, not only for our staff that are our wellness staff, so like, such as psychologists and, and social workers and counselors and PPWs, but also for teachers, also for our security staff, um, and potentially even for people that are in, in building such support personnel that are with students on a daily basis. Um, this, could, this could also involve working with external partners, nonprofit organizations, bringing in leading experts, uh, as well as the folks that we're currently working with, right? So JCRC and the Black and Brown Coalition and uh, the American Defamation League and so on and so forth. Um, so this really would support that initiative, which right now is not necessarily funded by any line item anywhere. Um, and it is work that we have begun uh, and plan on doing you know, for the foreseeable future. 
Great. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, the opportunity was great here in terms of the cybersecurity component, given the increase in the number of attacks that are, are being levied towards K-12 institutions. Uh, I'm certain everyone has probably read about one or two in the news recently uh, that are pretty sizable and have a tremendous impact on organizations like ours. So the timing of this grant was great because it allowed us an opportunity to look for ways to strengthen our posture for cybersecurity, both internally with our systems, with our review of contracts, partnering with general counsel and procurement, but also looking at ways specifically to educate our school communities around educating students, educating the parents, uh, educating staff around uh, those, those areas of concern that are ways that some of these uh, bad actors and hackers are finding ways into our network. So this was an opportunity for us. The, the, the grant here will be done or will be used primarily to fund uh, the staff necessary to dedicate a function like this with an emphasis on educating first our school communities and second strengthening our existing cybersecurity platform. And the last piece to it, which is not necessarily under my purview, but I'm familiar with because I've been in some of the, the, the conversations, is to strengthen the caregivers on duty uh, program, which we've piloted in some of our schools over the last couple of years, and to provide some training, right, on de-escalation, mm -hmm. on, uh, on, on um, teenage brain development, as well as uh, building positive relationships with teenagers in schools, um, and to really support and enhance that program specifically. I should also add that a lot of the activities around the staff and the programs in particular will mirror what we just heard at a White House summit, where, which was focused on K-12, uh, bringing different institutions together to share experiences, to share advice. And the activities that we'll, we'll partake in with this grant will align directly with those recommendations. Thank you. Could I just, uh, just do a follow-up really quickly? So the plans <coughs> of this, um, of this plan in this uh, grant program is how long? Three years. Three years. Uh, September of 2025 is $3 million. So it starts in September 2025? No, it's so through. It ends. It, it ends. ends September yes. So would you give us, um, a, in a halfway point, uh, what we have achieved? Is there like a timeline with benchmarks? Um, how, you know, what are we developing? And um, I guess my interest is also very much on, um, I love engaging the parents through caregivers and engaging community members with uh, training on cyber safety. Um, I know that, that a local state's attorney also does a lot of that along with the police department. They, they're very engaged also doing that. Is there gonna be any, um, any work along with those agencies and are you going to do the bilingual component when you do that? Oh, I can speak to that. One of the things that we've done quite a bit is we uh, will both participate and partner with other Montgomery County agencies, particularly uh, around October. <clears throat> excuse me, October every year there's a Cybersecurity Awareness Month that takes place in the county. Uh, we intend to have this uh, have the the all the activities align with some of those as well. But there will be various campaigns where we'll look to find ways to educate our communities uh, through a number of different methods. Uh, one of the things that we'll do, and, and to come back to the idea of kind of measuring the progress throughout, is we'll look to add and meet with community, uh, like a, uh, just community members and groups to see how, uh, how, how things are going. Also, we can see through data, through some of our education platforms, uh, how effective uh, some of the education is in terms of the numbers of, numbers of preventative, uh, the things that we've done to prevent some of the attacks. We can see some of the data that will be reflected on that for anyone who's inside of our network. We hope that the data will reflect the, the positive education in that as well. So just to, to answer my half of the question, um, in terms of the bilingual nature, yes. So um, we have l last year and are continuing this year to do our parent specific, our, our Spanish language and other language specific sessions, not translated, but in that language um, around hate bias and bullying and reporting. We've worked with multiple different organizations, but primarily Identity to do one, one of those last year. And we're planning a series of those through my shop right now. Um, in terms of measuring uh, impact, that's part of the grant application and monitoring process with the state. You're required to do that. But we already have, the benefit is that we have, we're not taking this money and doing, some, we, and doing something with it. 
We have a plan that has inherent data already included for impact measurement, um, such as on a weekly basis. Right now, we are monitoring our, our bullying and our, our hate bias data and looking for trends. Um, and so that's constant work. And so we're using those data points as impact, right? Are we seeing progress here? So um, those will be the metrics that are included as part of the grant and that we hold ourselves accountable for. Thank you. And finally, the seven six. Same question. Just wanted to understand more about the um, that grant and its um, addressing the overrepresentation of our Latinx students in special education. Yes. So thank you for pulling this. I'm really excited about this work. Um, as a result of a spring uh, announcement from MSDE for this competitive award to three LEAs in Maryland, we um, were one of the three to get a $1 million grant for the 23-24 school year. And we are using this money to address over-identification of students who are EML um, in the identification class uh, category of cognitive disabilities. Um, when we were completing the application process, we looked at the data. We had an opportunity to explore which subgroups were uh, most impacted. Um, and so that was the reason why we chose that particular subgroup. Um, in the grant, we intend to work on developing a more comprehensive MTSS guide for um, schools to use so that we can get ahead of the um, special education identification process and ensure that we are meeting students in those earlier tiers of intervention and support. <clears throat> We're uh, working with our partners and technology to ensure that we have a comprehensive data management system that addresses MTSS levels that students may be going through. We're providing professional learning for EML teachers, um, as well as uh, our providers who do bilingual assessments, um, as well as our interpreters who interpret for bilingual assessments and during IEP meetings, so that we can ensure that parents understand um, what the assessments mean, that the assessments are valid and reliable. Um, and then we are also um, providing instructional materials that um, promote positive assessments of our students in EML. And the great part about this grant is, well, several things. But um, one is that we're addressing the um, some of the outcomes and recommendations that were um, identified in the Cal report or the Center for uh, Applied Linguistics report, where um, they recommended that we have a guidance document that addressed how we identify students who are EML um, and also <coughs> students with disabilities. Um, but the other piece to that is while we are targeting EML students who are identified as students with intellectual disabilities to reduce that number, the work that we do will be beneficial to all of our students who are in those over-identified uh, subgroups, uh, African-American students, students who are identified as emotional, with emotional disabilities. So we'll be able to utilize this work um, with um, our school psychologists, with our general and special educators, um, and we're working closely with our partners in OSEP um, to to provide the uh, supports and build out the work that will occur during this grant. Quick question. So this is going to allow you to get two full time folks to be able to help you with this? <coughs> you, you, you're not that big of a <laughs> department, so I just want to make sure you have what you need. And if there's anything else we can do to, to make sure to support you to be able to, you know, to achieve this. Right, so um, we did include in the grant two instructional specialist positions to work directly on the grant and the outcomes that we listed in the application so that they could be committed to this work while a year seems like a long time and a million dollars seems like a lot of money. It's a very short period of time um, uh, for big outcomes. I guess that's my concern, and I'm just going to say now that I feel like a year might not be enough to be able to complete the work, and I think we might have to think about that when we're doing the budget, just to have mm -hmm. a plan B to ensure that the work is completed 
um, in a manner that it does make a difference <laughs> for for our kids. So similar to what Mr. Uh, Monteleone said, we have reporting requirements with the state so that we can have those benchmarks to ensure that the, move, the work is moving along. Their grants, three years. Yes, there's the different... Um, <laughs> Ours is one. <laughs> um, and, and when we applied, we said, wow, this is a big, it's, this is a, a large body of work um, that we need to move on quickly. Um, while we have the two instructional specialist positions that will be directly supporting the work, we also have um, various people from OSEP, from OSE, that will be working um, as committee members um, or work group members to help support the work. We also are enlisting some experts in the field of um, bilingual education and um, special education for students who are multilingual to come in and help us to build out the work. Thank you. Thank you. So um, that we can get a motion to move 7 4, 7 5, and 7 6 in block. Motion. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that's unanimous with those present. <coughs> Moving on to not, item number eight on our agenda. Um, can I get a motion to move items 8.1 and 8.2 in block? Motion. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. That's unanimous with those present. Uh, item number 8.3, do we have any <coughs> new business to bring forward? Seeing none. Uh, item number nine for informational purposes only. And can I get a motion to adjourn? Motion. Second. All in favor, raise your hands. And that's unanimous with those present. We are adjourned. Yeah.